Board of Supervisors Land Use Meeting and Flood Control District Meeting to order. Clerk, can you please call the roll? Thank you, Chairwoman Vargas. Supervisor Anderson? Here. Supervisor Montgomery Stepp? Supervisor Desmond? Here. Vice Chair Lawson Reamer? And Chairwoman Vargas? Vargas here. All right, we will take our closed session after this land use session and then report back at the end. We will now proceed with non-agenda public communications. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board on subject matters within the board's jurisdiction, but not an item on today's agenda. The only action that the board may take is a referral to the chief administrative officer. Reminder that according to Rule 4A, members of the public that are non-English speaking and need, to interpret need interpretations assistance will get twice the allotted time for their comments, which is four minutes. As a reminder, according to the board rules and procedures, audience members uh, shall not whistle, clap, stomp feet, or anything that disrupts the proceedings. And to better facilitate the meeting, we will have five speakers in person, five speakers via phone, and the rest of non-agenda public communication will be heard at the close of today's meeting. So, uh, Clerk, can you please call the speakers for the public? Thank you, Chairman Vargas. We have 21 requests to speak on matters not listed on the agenda, five, uh, six in person, and 16, oh, excuse me, we have 22 matters to speak on this matters not listed on the agenda six individuals in person and 16 requesting to speak by phone. For those that have requested to speak via phone, if you could please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speakers. As your name is called, if you could please come forward and stand against the east wall under the murals until it is your turn to speak. You'll then have two minutes to address the board. I'd like to invite the forward the following individuals, Robert German, Gambler, Kate, Samantha, and I believe it's Amit. If you could please begin your comments by stating your name for the record. And again, we'll be hearing from the first five speakers, and then we'll take the additional sixth speaker after the conclusion of today's meeting. Robert German. Uh, you don't have the hand, the slide's going. Okay, great. California senators, California council members, California attorneys, California community members, California social justice organizers, California small business owners, California environmental groups, California teachers support this bill. Please watch this video. Uh, the second slide shows wh who else the bill affects. It would be banning leaded fuel. It's also the bill itself. Please read it. It is talking about replacing leaded fuel with safe and available, or excuse me, leaded fuel with safe and available leaded unleaded fuel. Number three is it affects aviation workers like this fueler who breathes leaded fuel every time he fills up a plane. The picture of fueling system is out of date. Number four, no regard for the health of children who are exposed to a toxic environment with no notification of leaded ab gas to their parents. STEM aviation is more interested in proclaiming themselves as a tax exempt organization than protecting the children. Please watch STEM aviation video filmed at Palomar and Gillespie Field airports. Number four, list the stakeholders who oppose the EPA endangerment finding on leaded avgas. This page is taken from the County of San Diego Aviation official webpage. Notice, not one senator, elected public official, community member, social justice organizer, environmental groups, or teachers association is listed. The County of San Diego Airports page only lists aviation stakeholders such as Pilots Association, aviation manufacturers, aviation businesses, organizations that put their profits before our family, our communities, and even their workers who make their profits. I ask the Board of Supervisors to support California Senators, and I'm going to butcher this, up oh, Bill 1193. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, my name is Kate Ioni. I stand before you not just as an animal advocate, but as a concerned member of our community in the third supervisorial district. I am here to urge officials of San Diego County to help the neglected horses and dogs on the Rancho Santa Fe property owned by Deborah Barkley and Craig Netwig. It is painfully obvious from the pictures and videos that these animals are not getting the bare necessities of food and shelter. Last year, an emaciated horse was discovered on that property. Reports indicate that despite, ple despite pleas for mercy, the horse was left to suffer for hours before their inevitable demise. Despite repeated complaints, officials have yet to take decisive action. And now, tragically, another horse has met the same fate, found dead, deprived of care and compassion they deserved. 
These horses and dogs endure conditions that no living being should ever have to face. Filthy environments, lack of shelter, starvation, and neglect. They suffer in silence, denied the basic necessities of life, while those responsible turn a blind eye. This breaks California animal welfare law, and this cannot be the standard of care we accept in our community. We call upon our officials to seize the remaining animals from these properties, to bring charges against those accountable for this cruelty. We urge the Poway Sheriff's Station to mobilize their dedicated detectives to investigate these allegations thoroughly, and we implore District Attorney Summer Steffen to pursue charges against Deborah Barkley and Craig Netwig for their heinous acts of animal cruelty. But our work doesn't stop there. We must demand reform within the County of San Diego Department of Animal Services to ensure that no animal suffers due to shortcomings ever again. Thank you. Hello, my name is Samantha Prado. I'm here to voice concern for an ongoing animal neglect case in Rancho Santa Fe. On March 27, 2023, and on January 24, 2024, two equines were found dead on a property. The remaining horses are emaciated, living in their own waste, have no protection from weather conditions, sick from hunger, their hooves are covered in fecal matter, and when they do eat, they are fed moldy hay. The Department of Animal Services has investigated but did not accomplish anything. The animals are still in the same situation as they were found. Their circumstances have been documented on the news with neighbors coming forward as, wit as witnesses to the neglect. They do not receive veterinary care and have been wounded and left to bleed. Please remove all of the horses and dogs to be sent to a sanctuary through the working detectives in the Poway Sheriff's Station. Investigate Deborah Barkley and Craig Netwig for allegations of animal cruelty through District Attorney Summer Stephan, and please begin reforming the County of San Diego Department of Animal Services. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm going to speak on the same issue. Uh, my name is Amit Alesia, uh, and I'm an animal advocate, community organizer, and a concerned member of the 4th Supervisor District. Uh, I'm here to implore the San Diego County officials to assist the neglected horses and dogs residing on that Santa, Rancho Santa Fe property. It's obvious that these animals are not getting their basic needs of food, water, and shelter. It's obvious also that the caretaker of these animals are breaking California Law 597B. Let me read it to you if you're not clear. Whoever has a charge or custody of the animals otherwise subject to animals to needless suffering or inflict unnecessary cruelty upon the animal or in any manner abuses an animal or fails to provide the animal with proper food, drink, or shelter, or protection for the weather is each offense guilty of a crime punishable pursuant to subdivision D. In addition to breaking the animal welfare laws, neighbors are terrified by Deborah Barkley and the neglected dogs. One neighbor said, we have seen well over the legal limit of dogs on the property. The dogs are aggressive. They leave the property. We've had them on our yard where they've charged us. They've charged our daughter. Before animals and neighbors suffer, I urge you to rescue the remaining animals on these properties to bring charges against those accountable for this cruelty. We urge the Poway Sheriff Station to mobilize their de dedicated detectives to investigate these allegations thoroughly. And we implore District Attorney to pursue charges against Deborah Barkley and Craig Newtwig for their acts of animal cruelty. Also, I urge you to provide resources and restructure the Department of Animal Services so that they are able to do their job properly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to Brian so that you can follow up with some of the requests. Yeah, if you'd like, we can have um, a member of our staff meet out back and talk about uh, the work that Animal Services is doing with respect to this. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> Good 
gambler here. People by the lies. No matter how they said. Why would I do wrong when I know what's right? So, I've been asking for a question for several years now, and apparently the county finally gave me an answer. So apparently for the petition for Governor Newsom, we rejected 40% of the signatures. I want to repeat that. We re rejected 40% of the signatures for that petition. We rejected nearly 60,000 signatures because they did not match. Those same people probably went around and voted, yet we only rejected 5,000 ballots. We only rejected like 4% of the ballots, and some of those were because they did not have a signature. So my question is to you guys. Did the county of San Diego make a mistake and count fraudulent ballots for the Governor Newsom election? Or did, were they purposely trying to divert the will of the people and purposely exclude certain signatures on the pe petition? Which one is it? It can't be both. Have fun with that one because I'm going to be looking at the 50,000 people that you rejected and compare that and see how many of those ballots actually went through. And if those ballots went through, I want to know why those signatures were good for the ballot, yet were not good for the petition. So, do you guys still want to cover up fraud? Have fun with that. We will now hear from those that have requested to speak by phone. Again, we'll be hearing from the first five callers. The remaining callers will be heard at the conclusion of today's session. When it is your turn to speak, you'll be unmuted. You will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I'd like to remind the callers they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. And we'll go ahead and begin with our first caller. Hello. Monica, when you called me out from the dais because of my reaction to your comments, you not only proved my point, but you made it personal. The reason for my reaction that apparently triggered you was because you're typical. You're a typical politician. In this day and age, you think one would find it appalling that whenever they're recognized, it is almost always first for the color of their skin and not their achievements. Content of one's character matters not anymore. You don't even see it, do you? It's superficial pride, by the way. You didn't earn the color of your skin. You were born with it. You continue being a slave by being categorized away to accommodate a narrative that the establishment loves using to keep us separate. You allow for the system to continue to put you in a box. It's divide and conquer. Haven't you figured that out? Mental slavery is alive and well. No matter what bodysuit one wears, we are all the exact same beneath our skin. My reaction was due to your I take it personal comment regarding the refugee thing. Are you a refugee? Have you ever lived in a third world country? Have you ever experienced what an illegal or refugee has experienced crossing the border? Have you ever experienced being a non-citizen of this country fighting as a U.S. soldier? As a child, were you ever forced to pick fruits and vegetables in the fields of central California? My father was. My father experienced that. But guess what? He was in construction and a janitor. He supported a family of five on only his income. I have never once in my life felt the need until this moment to bring that up. I've never once tried to use his experience to my advantage. That was his experience. I'm not going to play victim or try to come up on what he had to endure. I will forever be grateful for all my father did, but I sure as hell would never use his life experience and act like I suffered through the same because I came from him. That is the that is the content of my character. What my father lived through being treated like a second class. Thank you. Your time is up. We'll go to our next caller. Paul Abode, um, I agree. Get the lead out of fuel. It does not belong there. Uh, contingency fees are becoming a larger issue than before in this time of increased pro
prices and other governments. We should not be paying more than 10%. The main problem with contingency fees is that the contractor usually puts it in an account he controls with the idea of refunding the, quote, unneeded, unquote. You mean ungrafted difference? Uh, the standard is 5 to 10%. Cal State Libraries love you. Set it at nine percent. If there is a problem with additional expenses, the contractor could make his case then. Why are we taxpayers supporting these large payments? If you're awarding more than a ten percent fee, the agenda should explain why. And the sewage plant issue. There is now a broken sewage treatment plant in Point Loma. Luckily, there is apparently no active leak right now. But whoever runs the plant in coordination with you guys should be a bit more proactive about fixing such problems in this county before the ones in TJ. It seems, it seems that your uh, favorite tactic is to blame the other guy. George Washington was a great president in part because he never blamed any of the country's problems on the previous administration. Please take the initiative. You will save money. Thank you. Your time is up. We'll go to our next speaker. Good morning, Board of Supervisors, Chair Vargas. My name is Terry Ann Skelly. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to report on the role of big marijuana in creating health inequities through their promotion of smoking and vaping, especially those concentrated THC intoxicating products that have candy-like appearance and taste. I work in public health, especially on behalf of the county's very diverse youth and after-school mentoring programs. I refer county supervisors and staff to the research of the well-respected Dr. Neon Guy, chair of the Department of African American Studies at Virginia Commonwealth, Commonwealth University. Her research concerns and centers around cancer and chronic disease-related health inequities among minority populations. Research suggests when neighborhood environments include tobacco stores and pot shops with their accompanying advertising and promotions, that there is higher smoking and vaping behavior. It's important to remember that lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer-related death in the United States. And African Americans have the highest lung cancer incidence and morality rates compared with all other racial and ethnic groups. I respectfully suggest that the county's marijuana business expansion only creates more physical and mental health inequities. So a proposal that suggests that racial disparities could be improved by spending money to have more businesses which sell smoking and vaping products is horribly flawed. Living in the county unincorporated areas has many challenges around obtaining the necessary and comprehensive health resources we need. This is not the time to add more, uh, more business burdens to our residents who want their children to grow up simply to be drug-free, healthy, and mentally strong. Thank you. Thank you. Your time is up. We'll go to our next speaker. Kevin Stevenson. Okay, first off, I just wanted to point out that MAGA Republicans are trying to waste our taxpayers' money yet again with another recall effort against Governor Gavin Newsom. Apparently, they think that uh, wasting between 200 and $300 million in 2021 just to have their asses handed to them wasn't enough. They want to waste more taxpayers' money. And yet these same individuals like to claim that California, Sacramento, is uh, wasting their taxpayers' money uh, when in – not to get into debate about how Sacramento is 
spending money. But the things that Republicans tend to complain about are usually things worth spending taxpayers' money on, whereas what they want to do is force yet another special election and try to impose their minority rule on all of us. And it's not even going to work because your propaganda does not resonate with people. And it's funny how Gambler thinks that a bunch of signatures uh, were just not counted supposedly valid signatures. Well, when your entire recall effort is based on uh, being politically motivated, it's easy to see why a lot of fraudulent signatures would have been included in the initial tally and then not counted when the signatures were certified. But you still got to waste your taxpayers' money anyway, so what are you complaining about? Also, I wanted to quickly mention the brown shirts in the audience yesterday that were shut, that were silencing voices against item 14 yesterday was truly disgusting, and I hate seeing this here. Thank you. Your time is up. We'll go to our next speaker. Angelo Sulin, I'm going to read the acceptance speech of Yuval Abraham and Basil Al-Adra for their documentary, No Other Land. Yuval and Basil are the same age. I'm Israeli, Basil is Palestinian. And in two days, we will go back to a land where we are not equal. I'm living under a civilian law, and Basil is under military law. We live 30 minutes from one another, but I have voting rights. Basil is not having voting rights. I'm free to move where I want in this land. Basel is like millions of Palestinians locked in the West Bank. The situation of apartheid between us is inequality. It has to end. Since October 7th, 30,000 Palestinians in Gaza, 12,000 of them children, have been killed by Israel's government. Another 50,000 Palestinians are injured. Thousands and thousands are missing under the rubble. Those who are alive are being intentionally starved by the blockade of aid entering Gaza. The San Diego Palestinian community and those who have woken up from the indoctrination and lies fed to them by the media, Christian Zionism, and in our schools, they're now standing up for Palestinian human rights, their right to return to their homeland, their right to live in their homeland, free of occupation and siege. We are waiting for you, County of San Diego Board of Supervisors, our elected officials, to also publicly recognize our human rights as well. We will continue to expose the corruption that exists among the leaders here that take money from pro-Israel lobby groups. And we will let our San Diego communities know that you're not looking out for our best interests, despite all the suffering we're experiencing here in San Diego. But rather, your best Thank you. Your time is up. And Chairwoman Vargas, that concludes the request for non-agenda public communication this morning. Again, all the remaining speakers will be heard at the conclusion of today's session. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the approval of minutes, statement, and proceedings for the regular meeting of February 7th, 2024, and the Flood Control District meeting of January 9th, 2024, and February 7th, 2024. Is there a motion to approve? Thank you. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. And Chairman Vargas, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present. Voting aye. All right, we will now proceed with the formation of our consent calendars, item uh, 1 to 11 in Fund Control District, item number 1. Members of the public will be able to comment on the consent calendar after the supervisors pull the items they would like for discussion. Um, I'm going to hand it over to the crew for a couple of comments. Thank you, Chairman Vargas. I'd like to note for the record that item 5 is being withdrawn at the request of the Deputy Chief Administrative Officer, so comments to item 5 will need to be directed towards the withdrawal. I would also like to note that we received an errata for item 11, which revises recommendation three and removes recommendation four. And item four is being pulled for discussion at the request of the deputy county, deputy chief administrative officer. All right. Uh, Supervisor Anderson? Nothing at this time. Thank you. Okay. Supervisor Montgomery, step? Nothing at this time. Thank you. Supervisor Desmond? Uh, thank you, Chair. Nothing to pull, but I do have a comment on uh, item 11. Uh, this is a board letter that, that I'd submitted, um, and I'd appreciate my uh, uh, peers' uh, uh, support on this item. The uh, 
this is an ask for the uh, staff to come back with a plan. And just a couple of quick comments. Uh, this is changing from a deposit-based housing process to a one-time fee-based housing process. Or for um, housing proce uh, projects up to 11 units and help them to provide more cost certainty to home builders. We already do this for two lot subdivisions. And the idea here is to expand that two lot concept to include a wider range of housing projects to encourage more to come forward to hopefully build more housing in San Diego County. Under the current process, applicants are never entirely sure how much their project is gonna cost as they go through the uh, discretionary review process. Uh, builders have to keep funding and replenishing a trust account, typically for years, while, while they seek their permit approvals. Uh, it's unpredictable at best and housing stifling at, at, at worst. So today's action would add more predictability to our review process and for those projects, including those um, up from two up to 11 units, uh, which would align, also would align with our VMT guidelines. Uh, we, have a, we already have funding available in, in the budget for staff to go ahead as part of the errata and, and develop these options. And this is not a free ride. This is not yet free money for, you know, for housing. Uh, we, we, got, we still, the intent is cost, full cost recovery. But rather than a blank check with no end in sight, it's gonna be a fixed fee to provide certainty to, to home builders. I uh, look forward to my colleagues and hopefully supported this item and, and for staff to return with the uh, work workable options for implementation. So with that, I'll make a motion to approve the balance of the consent calendar. Thank you. Make a motion, Any a second motion? Sure. <laughs> okay, um, I just, two items that I just wanna say thank you uh, to the team for all the work on item number 10. Um, I wanna really uh, thank the Department of Parks and Rec uh, because they've managed an impressive, they manage 157 facilities and maintain over 300 miles, 80 miles of trails. Um, and on top of that, they are a regional leader when it comes to planting trees. And as you all know, it's uh, something that is a top priority for me. Last year we said we are gonna uh, plant 5,000 uh, trees and then we challenged the community to do another 5,000 and we were able to plant 10,000 tre trees in the county of San Diego, which is really, really, really important and powerful. And so I appreciate that we're really looking at this from an equity driven tree planting program and really think about, especially in our communities where we need more green spaces and, and trees are absolutely necessary. And then on the, um, is this the same one for FL 101? Yeah, right. So I just want to make sure on the item FL 01 on the flood control, I just want to thank the Department of Public Works for all their efforts to make sure that they're responding to the unprecedented emergency that took place a few weeks ago. Um, and then just really, uh, I know that they've been working around the clock to make sure that uh, our commitment, our communities um, are taken care of. So I just want to make, make sure I say thank you your uh, work doesn't go unnoticed and we're grateful for your continued service. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to public comment and as a reminder uh, for members of the public, please keep your comments related to those items only on the consent calendar and so now turn it over to the clerk. Thank you, Chairman Vargas. We have nine total requests to speak on items on the consent calendar, one individual in person and eight, request, and eight people requesting to speak by phone. Again, as a reminder, item number four was pulled from the consent calendar for discussion. So please hold your comments uh, for that item and item five was, was withdrawn. So you can only speak to the withdrawal of that item. For any members that requested to, uh, requested to speak on the remaining items on the consent calendar, if you could please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speakers. I'd like to invite forward Robert German. You have two minutes to address the board. You don't want to speak to this? Uh, clarification. If you pulled item four and that's the Carlsbad, ad, yeah, but they were supposed to change that. We, we can just, we can... We can move on if you don't. We have you for four, too. That's fine. All right, sounds good. We'll head over to our uh, phone caller. It's truth item one, Alta Loma Drive in the Mall is gonna have five culverts and a severely broken road repaired for $290,000, one third of it paid with loans. I still say these county permanent road divisions are pretty useless for property owners. 
Item two is vacating a piece of land at Avocado Boulevard and Valley to Oro for 13000 It was a park and ride area, but I doubt anybody ever used it to ride public transit. And three, if the Hilliker Egg Ranch has no objections, then hurry up and approve Glyke's property's $10,700 easement in Lakeside so we can have 142 single-family homes. Item six and seven, I learned that there's more federally mandated bureaucracy with co-permittees that include San Diego County, Orange County, and Riverside counties seemingly functioning as a type of regional governance over stormwater pollution. And it sounds like it's okay for businesses to pollute surface waters as long as they pay for permit permission from government. Total cost to county taxpayers for water quality monitoring and reporting, $25.5 million. Item 8, in 1969, another bureaucracy was created called the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project, another regional governance entity. This will cost the county 750000 to go to this unknown agency that engages in unknown scientific research and projects. Item 9, construction manager at risk. Well, what kind of contract name is that? That's actually a cap on their construction pricing, yet it sounds dangerous. It'll cost over $13 million to do renovations on the Heritage Park buildings to turn them into hotels or event centers and over a million dollars to operate. I love Old Town, but I haven't actually checked these buildings out before, so I'm putting it on my list. Thank you. And a 10 says that trees absorb oxygen, but they actually create oxygen by absorbing carbon. It's called science. It's also a little concerning to read about jail inmates being used to grow 2,000 trees on behalf of the county, while certain supervisors brag about trees being planted. I say if we're going to make them do $2 million worth of physical labor, maybe we should start with a broken sidewalk and pothole road. Priority, you know? And item 11. Thank you. Your time is up. We'll go to our next speaker. Gonzuelo, that is so funny. Yeah, how many how many trees did you get planted? Just more waste of taxpayer dollars because an average of 18% of planted trees are actually, they actually survive. Out of 100%, 18% of what you planted are gonna, is going to survive. So, okay, hold on, hold on. Um, so, so yeah, another waste of tax of tax dollars. Pathetic, but it was really refreshing having all those people there yesterday who saw the same things that we do. We see at every meeting. It was so refreshing. I can't wait to get a hold of these people. And um, yeah, it's just great. The great awakening is happening, and you guys are all. <laughs> You're going to fill it. You're going to fill all the decisions that you make on that dais. You are going to soon feel what the people feel. Thank you. We'll go to our next speaker. Paul Bold. Um contract for water quality. Water quality monitoring is good, but why are we not doing more to fix uh, the recurring problems? From Oceanside to Imperial Beach and now inland, the list keeps growing. Moreover, the water, even in upscale restaurants, still tastes like crap. Uh, we need to do more than just monitor the water quality to comply with standards from the Fed who can't be bothered to fix their own international sewage facility. You include an estimated cost of $12.5 million over five years, but no funding is identified. You should be able to do better than this. Since the state and Fed's finances are down the tubes, we need to be pr more proactive about identifying funding sources for state and federal priorities. The sustainability statement mentions regulatory limits, but it is increasingly obvious to me, if not others, that what also needs to be monitored is the cumulative buildup of these pollutants, germs, and other substances that you measured. Moreover, the statement mentions pollutants such as bacteria, nitrogen, and phosphorus. We need to go for the big sources like plastics, BPAs, PFAs, 
and non-harmful things like chloride and fluoride. Um, number uh, FOO1, it's a must-do item, which probably this uh, Tessa de Oro and Hidden Meadow Storm Drain stuff. It's a must-do item, which probably should have been fixed years ago. Shameful. Thank you. Your time is up. We'll go to our next speaker. Yeah, it's sad to think that for the stormwater cleanup and, and whatnot, that, you know, it's one, costing $1.8 million when it probably, you know, wouldn't be costing us that if you would have upkept the uh, infrastructure in the first place. And um, for number five that you took out with this, um, the airports and the waiving of the lease processing fees, good thing you took it out because you guys are bringing back COVID and you're acting like, you know, COVID's still the excuse that you can use for things failing miserably, and it's just pathetic. Um, and this water quality monitoring, yeah, just like, um, you know, uh, Paul was saying, there's fluoride in the water. You guys spray Roundup. I mean, you're doing things to the water and the land that are causing, you know, the pollutants, and then you don't ever want to acknowledge. I mean, fluoride is a runoff from a fertilizer, and it's a neurotoxin, and it's supposed to be in the water. It's pathetic that we continue to do these things and, like, poison the people and then act like, we're trying to protect, like, look for the pollutants and quit spraying Roundup before storms. How about things like that? Um, and acknowledge that you're doing it and quit spending the people's money to poison them. And then the trees, it's like it's quite funny because, Actually, I was going to say about the Heritage Park with the hotels. I'm just wondering if that's going to be somewhere where you're going to store the illegals since they're being, you know, placed in all these hotels all over the place. Um, but, you know, $2 million for 4,000 trees, water system, and removing of dead trees seems it's quite a lot of money to pretend to do something. And the fact that you think that it absorbs oxygen, <laughs> I wonder what scientists you're listening to because they are filters for CO2 and they create more oxygen, which is sad to see that you are like – continuing to lie to the people because the more trees you would have, the better off we would be to fight your whole climate change agenda. If you want to get rid of the CO2, plant some more trees and things like that. It will help. And then improving the certainty for people, you know, um, building stuff. You're always getting in the way of, you know, people being able to build, whether it be with the environment or all of these different things and the permitting process. And you act. Thank you. Your time is up. And to note for the record, that speaker was Audra. We'll go to our next speaker. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. This is Ann Riddle here. I called in to support item six regarding air, I'm sorry, water quality and the reduction of pollution to our local waterways. I want to explain. I want to express my appreciation for the staff comments regarding the county's commitment to our unincorporated area, which experiences disproportionately greater impacts when we have environmental stresses like poor water quality. And also a staff statement regarding the safeguarding uh, the health of us all by the water that's in our streams and on our beaches. I mention this because I have a, a suggestion. Across the state of California, there are many communities, cities and county unincorporated land that have elected to put smoke-free public place policies in effect quite successfully. It's a very low-cost project. It's just a matter of signage and good public education. And here in the county of San Diego, we have many nonprofits who are contracted with California Department of Public Health regarding the reduction of secondhand smoke and the reduction of smoking and vaping behavior that I know would be thrilled to assist the county in doing this. This is uh, particularly useful for those of us raising children in the unincorporated area who are drastically affected by the impact of secondhand smoke, as are the elderly and those with chronic diseases. Imagine if we could interrupt the amount of tobacco debris that hits our land and goes into our waterways and makes, it way, makes its way throughout all of the unincorporated area, which has the highest number of waterways in our county. Uh, thank you for letting me share that uh, no-nonsense solution that doesn't cost much money. Thank you. We'll go to our next speaker.
This is Vanessa Forsyth regarding uh, number four. Uh, the oh, pack. Vanessa. Vanessa. Our airport. Vanessa, item four has been pulled. So, so you can speak on that next. If you have any other comments on the, the entire rest of the balance of the consent calendar. So number five has been withdrawn. Okay, number, All right. Go ahead. Um, can I speak to the um, number five? Uh, five has been withdrawn, but you can speak to the withdrawal of the item. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think that this needs to be looked at more closely and that we need better representation um, by the stakeholders, which include the communities that are impacted by the Palomar Airport, not just um, people who fly there, in and out of there. And uh, I am concerned about the environmental impacts, uh, particularly the use of leaded fuel and how that harms our children. I am asking the Board of Supervisors to actually get a unleaded fuel tank so that pilots can use unleaded fuel there, which is much safer for our environment and the health of our community. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, Chairman Vargas, that concludes public com comment on the items on the consent calendar. Uh, with that, seeing no further discussion, please vote. And Chairwoman Vargas, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present. Voting aye. All right. So uh, the next items on the agenda are items number 4, 12, and 13, right? So, total. so we're going to go ahead and move on to discussion item 14. I mean, I'm sorry, 4. Administrative item second consideration and adoption of ordinance Palomar Airport Advisory Committee. And I'm going to um, take a minute to I'll so. wait. Um, I'll just turn it over to Brian. Thank you, Chairwoman Vargas. While the airport's team is getting uh, ready for the presentation, I will note that the amended ordinance that was posted inadvertently removed some language during the revision process. This language will be added back in, and the ordinance would need to come back for a second consideration at our next Board of Supervisors meeting on March 13. The team will cover this correction in their presentation, and I'll turn it over to the airport's team. Good morning, Chairwoman Vargas and members of the board. I'm Jamie Abbott, Director of County Airports in the Department of Public Works. Today are, we are returning to the board for a second hearing and amend the County Administrative Code to update the seat designations of the Palomar Airport Advisory Committee, or the PAC, as directed by the board on November 7, 2023. Before we, we begin, we are recommending an amendment to the ordinance language as introduced. There was a sentence inadvertently removed from the original ordinance language that is in place to prevent having more than three members on the PAC with financial interest voting on recommendations. We have replaced clean and strikeout versions of the ordinance to reinsert this language that we are submitting for the record. If the board is inclined to accept the recommended amendments, the matter would need to return to the board for approval at the next regular hearing for adoption on March 13th, 2024. The sentence that would be re-added to the administrative code states, no more than three members of the committee shall be financially interested in any business having a leasehold interest at Palomar Airport. Historically, all nine seats have been nominated by the District 5 supervisor, which is not reflective in the recent redistricting that occurred. If the amendment to the administrative code is approved, all PAC members will continue to be appointed by the Board of Supervisors, but the nomination process would change. Eight of the PAC seats would be divided evenly among the third and fifth supervisorial districts, with four seat nominations assigned to each district. In District 3, Two seats would be designated for representatives who reside in the city of Carlsbad, and two seats would be designated for representatives who generally reside in the third district. The district three supervisor would nominate the candidates to fill these seats. In district five, three seats would be designated for one representative who each reside in the city of Oceanside, San Marcos, and Vista. 
one seat will be designated for a representative who generally resides in the 5th District. The District 5 Supervisor would nominate the candidates to fill those seats. The ninth seat of the PAC will be nominated by the county's chief administrative officer. The seat would be designated for an industry representative with expertise and experience in Palomar Airport in aviation and or aeronautical airport business operations within fields such as, but not limited to, a pilot, mechanic, airplane owner, airport property business owner who is a lessee or sub lessee or other related fields who have demonstrated interest in the economic viability of the airport. The seat number and designations are assigned based on the board action and direction from November 7th of 2023 and will be administratively a guide for future nominations, either by new or reappointments to the Board of Supervisors. The terms of service for eight PAC members nominated by the supervisors will continue to run concurrent with the appointing supervisor. The CAO appointment will run concurrent with the District 3 supervisor. In accordance with board policy A74, which is not being amended, members on a county committee is limited to two consecutive terms. Next, I would like to provide some clarification to the appointment or reappointment schedule should this ordinance amendment take effect. If approved, this occurs 30 days after the final approval by the board for the purposes of public noticing and associated administrative actions. When the ordinance takes effect, those PAC members who were nominated and appointed during the District 5 supervisor's current term, beginning in January 2023, remain until the end of the term appointment. In this case, the appointees that represent both the Carlsbad seat and the Vista seat would remain on the PAC until the District 5 supervisor's term ends on January 2027. This is shown in yellow on the slide. Additionally, these members' seat numbers will change to align with the November 7, 2023 board direction that recommended allocating seat three to the Vista representative and seat five to the Carlsbad representative, as also shown on the slide. After January 4th, 2027, the seat five Carlsbad representative would be nominated by the District 3 supervisor. The PAC members who were nominated and appointed by the District 5 supervisor prior to the current term, which in this case are all other remaining PAC members shown in gray, are currently serving as a holdover appointment in accordance with board policy A74. Those seven seats would be up for consideration for either reappointment or appointment according to the new ordinance allotment. District 3 and District 5 supervisors and the CAO would nominate representatives. A supervisor or the CAO could nominate a member who is serving as a holdover to a new seat within their district should they desire. The nominations would then be taken to the entire board for approval and appointment at a subsequent hearing. Staff recommends approval of the second reading of the ordinance to amend the County Code of Administrative Ordinances, Section 731, Membership and Selection of Administrative Code, Article 40, to align PAC seat designations with the Board of Supervisors direction provided on November 7th, 2023. Staff also recommends amending the ordinance as introduced to reinsert the language that was inadvertently removed to prevent having more than three members of the PAC with financial interest voting on recommendations. If approved, the ordinance would return to the board for a third hearing on March 13th of this year, and if approved, would become effective 30 days from the date of approval. Chairman Vargas and members of the board, that concludes the presentation. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and open up for public comment and then my colleagues uh, for discussion. Thank you, Chairman Vargas. We have 11 total requests to speak, five individuals in person, and six requesting to speak by phone. I'd also like to note for the record, we did receive three e-comments on this item. None were in favor, two were in opposition, and one was neutral. For any members of the public that requested to speak on this item by phone, if you could please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll go ahead and begin with the in-person speakers. As your name is called, if you could please come forward and stand against the east wall under the murals until it is your turn to speak. And I'd like to invite forward the following individuals. Stephanie Jackal, Hope Nelson, Karina Contreras, Robert German, and Jason Haber. 
You have two minutes to address the board, and if you could please begin by stating your name for the record. And you can come forward in any order. Good morning. My name is Stephanie Jackal. I live in Vista, and I am speaking for South Vista Communities, a nonprofit organization established in 2006. We began engaging with Palomar Airport staff, the FAA, the Palomar Airport Advisory Committee, in 2008 about noisy, disruptive, and potentially dangerous airplane flights over South Vista neighborhoods. The founding documents of the PAC contain a list of duties and responsibilities of the PAC members, which is being given to you. What is sad is that PAC rarely, if ever, takes any actions fulfilling these responsibilities for VISTA. When residents go to PAC meetings to complain about the airplane overflight's detrimental impacts on residents' quality of life, we are told, we'll take it under advisement and get back to you. They never do. The overflight impacts continue unabated. The cities of Carlsbad, San Marcos, Oceanside, and Vista each have residents representing their city on the PAC. Last year's seats for representatives of Carlsbad and Vista were vacant. We are glad that the Carlsbad City Council nominee, Shirley Anderson, was appointed to the PAC by the supervisors. For Vista's representative, we were delighted when Vista City Council unanimously nominated Vista resident Tazim Nazim, Tazim Nizam, to fill Vista's seat on the PAC. However, Supervisor Jim Desmond ignored the unanimous selection of our City Council, did not even meet with Ms. Nizam, and instead appointed someone else, Armin Kurdian. Since Mr. Kurdian is supposed to represent VISTA, our board asked through PAC Chairman Cliff Kaiser to meet with him. We never had a reply. One might wonder how Mr. Kurdian can adequately represent the thoughts and issues of South East residents if he hasn't heard them presented or discussed. How long will we have to wait for a VISTA representative who knows and understands VISTA? How long will we have to wait for the PAC to seriously undertake its responsibility? Thank you. Supervisors and staff, my name is Hope Nelson, Carlsbad resident and past president of Citizens for a Friendly Airport. It is two and a half years since redistricting and Carlsbad's move to District 3, which triggered the need to recalculate the distribution of pack seats. <clears throat> two and a half years. After two and a half years, county staff has failed us and you have failed us. You're splitting seats between two districts and awarding a seat to the CAO, which is the first in county history. The CAO is not anyone's elected official. On top of that, you have a job description for the CAO seat that appears to be in violation of Government Code 1090, which in part states, and I'll quote, the purpose of Section 1090 is not only to strike at actual impropriety, but also to strike at the appearance of impropriety. Supervisor Lawson Reamer knows this, yet in listening to the February 7th Board of Supervisors meeting, she did not bring it up. You are all familiar with the job district, district, district description. Aren't you setting the county up for legal problems? And if not, please explain this to us. How do you square your proposed CAO position description with Section 1090? Not only are you coming up with a convoluted method of distributing seats, but still no conversation about waivers of term limits, ethics, and rules for recusal, which are sorely lacking at the Palomar Airport Advisory Committee. You spent two and a half years talking about nine PAC seats and nothing else related to the PAC issues. Under the circumstances, I suggest you fix the problems with the PAC, including the seat distribution, and do it quickly. Two and a half years is far too long for the minuscule amount of work you have done. Please do your job. Thank you. Hello, my name is Karina Contreras. I'm here in my capacity as council member for the city of Vista, District 1. Uh, as it was said by a previous speaker, the Vista City Council unanimously approved a nomination of Tazin Nizam uh, unfortunately, uh, Supervisor Desmond, I understand that you wanted someone with experience uh, in aviation. However, 
Uh, the individual selected can be seen more on Newsmax and OAN uh, than they are in our community. Uh, we really need someone who represents equity, who looks at environmental concerns and the environmental justice necessary uh, at Palomar Airport, uh, the Palomar Airport Advisory Committee. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really just appalled that we could have a unanimous nomination and the City of Vista has such a dynamic council with everybody on from the right to the left uh, on the political spectrum. And we came to a decision that the best person to represent us on this advisory committee is Tazeen Nizam. So I wanna keep my comments brief, but I just wanna implore you to please take a look and seriously consider how your cities and city councils, which some of you have been on, that are close to the ground, how our nominations are taken by this board. And I hope that in the future they are taken much more seriously. Thank you. Robert German, Citizens Against Gillespie's Expansion Low-Flying Aircraft, but this pertains to Palomar and all of the county airports. Please have the Department of Public Works assume the responsibility of fueling aircraft at Palomar and all of our county airports. This is your right. Your right is listed and explained in the GAO report dated July 2021, Aviation Services. This change would create good jobs with a living wage and benefits. This would be a change at the county's non-union double-breasting airports. Please have a vapor recovery system installed at all county airports that fuel aircraft. County of San Diego airports would pay for these improvements from the airport enterprise fund with no cost to the taxpayer. So uh, I got some time, look at that. Um, these airport committees, I believe after attending them for 10 years are more of a land use issue. That's what an ALP is. So having people with financial interests on these committees is, I wouldn't call it ridiculous, but it's just not serving the community. I mean, uh, we are always referred to these airport community, com uh, committees to voice our grievances, but yet when we go to them, the first thing out of their mouths are, you're not a pilot, you don't need to know, with simple questions about what's going on at the airport. And I believe super, de uh, forget it, I won't make a personal comment. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Vargas, members of the board. My name is Jason Haber. I'm here representing the city of Carlsbad. Uh, the city submitted a comment letter on this item, and we appreciate the efforts of Supervisor Lawson Reamer and Supervisor Desmond, as well as of county airport staff to uh, update the county's policies and procedures related to PAC membership and selection. Palomar Airport is located in Carlsbad, and therefore the city and our residents have a direct interest in county decisions and actions concerning the airport. Uh, the city is appreciative of the two dedicated seats that are uh, indicated for Carlsbad residents to uh, occupy on the pack. And we also appreciate um, the county's responsiveness to several of the points that were raised in our comment letter. Um, with that, I'll just raise a couple and highlight a couple of those. One, that we really encourage the county to ensure a seamless transition as the appointments go from the current board membership to uh, that under the new ordinance. Uh, and then second, we're very supportive of the proposed changes uh, that staff has brought forward that would limit the number of committee members with a financial interest uh, or professional interest in the airport. Uh, so again, we appreciate you bringing up this uh, item and uh, considering the remaining items within our letter. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will now hear from those that have requested to speak by phone. Again, when it is your turn you'll, to speak, you'll be unmuted. You will then hear a recording to tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I'd like to remind the callers that should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. And we'll go ahead and begin with our first caller. Good morning. Vicki Syage, Carlsbad resident and current president of Citizens for Friendly Airport. 
C4FA opposed the recent changes approved by the Board of Supervisors for the PAC because the county's approach is incorrect and incomplete. Due to time limitations, I'll be addressing only two of the issues with the new proposal, conflict of interest and recusals. Plain and simply, PAC members should not have a financial interest in Palomar Airport or any of its businesses. It's in violation of the county's own coal, own, own coal code as well as federal law. Standard county policies regarding conflicts of interest should be adhered to. The current PAC does not do so. There is no enforcement and no consequences for either county or federal violations. The violations have been numerous and egregious over the years. For example, at the last PAC meeting, a member who owns a leasing business at Palomar Airport refused to recuse himself even after being asked to do so by another PAC member. There was no county legal staff present for legal advice. The member simply refused to recuse. The PAC was discussing and voting on whether to recommend airport leases go out for bid in the RFP process or if they should be automatically renewed to current leaseholders. That is, him to the tune of millions of dollars. How can that be? How can the Board of Supervisors allow that to happen and continue to happen? Any financial interest in Palomar Airport should be an automatic disqualifier for a position on the PAC. One can understand the airport and its businesses without making money from it. Recusals must be enforced. Refusing to recuse oneself should result in an automatic dismissal from the PAC and a ban from serving on any county commission. Ethics matter. Please lead by example. Ban PAC members from having financial interest at Palomar Airport, ensure no conflicts of interest, and, and um, enforce the recusal process. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. We'll go to our next speaker. Hi, Paul Bold. Um, I, I agree. Uh, having any hack members with a conflict of interest on the board is totally undemocratic. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm really shocked and concerned that you're even uh, considering this. I mean, you know, I don't know who recommended this, that uh, three members can have conflict of interest, but um, I certainly hope he doesn't serve on any legal body. Uh, thank you for amending the ordinance to include that the airport advisory committee should have representatives from each area it impacts. However, the ordinance should be further amended to specify that um, the selectees, more than one, should have experience in their urban planning and or airport management and or aviation fields. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next speaker. Consuelo. Conflicts of interest galore. That is the only way how this board knows how to work. Epitome of arrogant, deceptive hypocrites. How long do the people have to come here with their concerns regarding this airport issue? The supervisors don't represent their constituents. They're too busy with other things like being interviewed by the media, acting like they're doing their jobs. Right, Desmond? The airport enterprise funds and not the taxpayer money being used is a great idea. Start listening to real people like Robert Gernman and the Citizens for Friendly Airport, not the paid shills they're speaking. Thank you. We'll go to our next speaker. Yeah, this is so convoluted, it's, but it's not surprising. This is just the way that you guys work. And, you know, I mean, we have corrupt people putting in more corrupt people to do what needs to be done. That's why all these committees or boards or, you know, councils or whatever they are, um, working groups, you know, when they're appointed, it's all to continue to push a certain agenda. And the fact that you have 
people with conflicts of interest and, you know, um, money um, making, uh, you know, uh, interest in, in the money. Um, it, it's just that because you know that they're going to be the ones determining, um, you know, things if they have a financial interest in all the things that they're being decided. And um, but it's totally not surprising because this is what happens. This is why there's so much incest going on all these boards because you know you have to continue to do what needs to be done. You'll pretend that you're going to like give you know some people from the community a say, but how is it that when people come into those meetings, nobody listens? It's just like coming in here. You guys don't listen. You're on your phone. You don't really give two craps about what people are saying. You're pretending to so that you can virtue signal and gaslight the people like it's us and not you. But, you know, none of these are set out to do and represent the constituents that either you have or anybody on this um, committee has. And um, so it's just, you know, it's the way it's supposed to work. It's all by design. It's all meant to keep the people out from being able to redress anything and get things done that they want. But it's a perfect way for you guys to get done what you want um, through making all of these committees. And so it's just an illusion that the people have to understand that, you know, these aren't set up for us to get anywhere that we want. It's for them to get wherever they want, to put money in their pockets, and to make sure that their friends and cronies are the ones, um, you know, with the financial interests are in there. And, you know, it doesn't matter if there's conflicts of interest. Every one of you guys has them. And so it's very sad to see that this continues like it does. Thank you. Your time is up. And we'll go to our final speaker for this item. Hey, it's true. The county still wants the Palomar Airport Advisory Committee to have a big airport business industry rep on the committee. Taking away a seat from regular people affected by concerns such as noise pollution or environmental pollution coming from the airport. The city of Carlsbad is already organizing against both the FAA's and the county's nonsensical blame games and lies about who's responsible for addressing concerns regarding the airport. Now, I think it's one thing to prefer at least one pilot or mechanic beyond the committee to provide knowledge and expertise on the requirements the airport may need to maintain safety for the affected neighborhoods, such as Carlsbad, Oceanside, San Marcos, and Vista. But to require a business stakeholder on the committee, it shows conflict of interest biased by the county, clearly motivated by political and financial gains, such as big business taxes and maintaining the lease agreement whether or not the affected neighborhoods agree. I still ask. What expertise does Sarah have that she should be picking a rep to be on this committee? How does she determine who an industry expert is? And how does she know that they actually care about the affected neighborhoods? And what prevents conflict of interest? Is this just another county game that tips the balance of power and decision against regular people in favor of big business and big tax money coming in for them to spend? Because the CEO is not a third district nominee. There is no nomination if the people did not have a say in the matter. That would amount to a county and pick minion. I feel like the allegedly unintendedly removed language about disallowing multiple big business reps on the committee was a bit of a Freudian slip about what the county would love to have. No public input. Because when you take away a seat on a committee away from regular people who are directly affected, then you have stolen their right to representation, and that's wrong. Whoever approves is flying too low on this one. And I'm going to use Michael Brando saying, you need to stay in your lane. Stay in your fight path. How dare you? Thank you. Thank you. And Chairwoman Vargas, that concludes public comment on this item. All right. Uh, Vice Chair Lawson Reamer. Um, thank you so much. So I have a, a number of questions, uh, mostly for legal counsel, uh, but a little bit as well for, for our staff um, who've been working so hard on this. Um, before I ask my questions, I just want to uh, make some comments, um, partly for my, my colleagues who, uh, this is not their airport and they're wondering what's going on here, <laughs> um, but also a little bit for, for staff to, to kind of uh, give some context to the questions that I'm asking so um, that they're not just, they don't just seem um, uh, technical, but I, that I, I'm kind of putting in context what uh, the, the big concerns are. Um, I think just going back, you know, we, we've heard a lot of testimony today. We've heard testimony of her, uh, the last time this ordinance came forward. I've certainly had quite a number of meetings with constituents um, who are very concerned about 
uh, the noise of the Palomar Airport um, and the impact of uh, low flights and late flights and odd hours of flights um, on, on the community and the quality of life of, of people in the surrounding neighborhood. Um, and a concern, I think, uh, that I've heard voiced um, by people who are here to testify today, so th thank you for coming and voicing your concerns, but also from other community members that, I, that are not here today, that um, the, the prior PAC board kind of historically has not been um, responsive to those expressions of concerns about noise and has not uh, been very helpful. Um, in trying to tackle tackle the impacts on the community. And so, you know, when we're now talking about the composition of this PAC board, you know, I think at core, um, there's a concern, at least this is what I've, you know, been told many times, that um, how do we get a board that can really um, be responsive to community interests um, and, and do what's needed to, to protect the, the well-being and the quality of life of neighbors um, and make sure that, that people are not um, being negatively impacted by flights, you know, in the middle of the night or really low over schools or really loud. Um, and that's really connected with kind of a fun, uh, kind of an analysis or a, a concern that there is a potentially a, a a potential conflict of interest between um, people who have um, a financial interest in the airport um, and potentially in expanding or increasing airport operations uh, versus uh, kind of a, the other imperative, which is uh, being uh, cognizant of the impact on the surrounding community. So I just wanted to say that because I think that's what we're really talking about here. It's not completely clear when we're just arguing about whether I get the seats or Jim gets the seats or who the seats are. So I think that's sort of the big picture. Um, so I just wanted to ask some questions because these questions have come up um, in my conversations with, with community members. Um, and then I just had a, a couple comments. Um, so I guess my first question just does in address this conflict of interest question um, that that some of our uh, speakers raised. And I just was hoping, um, Tom, if you could address that a little bit. I know that the what I've been asked is, you know, is there a conflict of interest if the PAC board is being asked to make decisions about uh, land use or about, um, you know, how operations of the airport, uh, about noise, anything, operations that might impact flight patterns, right? There's a lot sort of that we're asking the PAC board to, con to opine on. Um, is there a potential conflict of interest if an individual or a business has some kind of, you know, financial interests? Um, and I, because that, that's what I've really heard is sort of a concern that there, that there could be a conflict. And, and I think it comes and it, it uh, plays out in two places. One is this specifically around who could be appointed to the backboard at all, right? Like the idea of having an industry seat that someone might have a direct financial interest, or even if it's not an industry seat, if it's just a general seat, but someone happens to have a financial interest. So there's sort of the appointment question. And then there's the second question around like recusal. When would it be appropriate? Uh, to recuse, for someone to have to recuse themselves because that's been another question that's been ongoing. So appointment and recusal, uh, how conflict of interest um, and having a financial interest uh, may or may not um, uh, invoke uh, the county's conflict of interest provision. So if you could just talk to me, explain this to me. Sure. Um, Supervisor Lawson, Rima, thank you for that question. Um, the, the first and foremost, the Palomar Airport Advisory Committee is an advisory committee. They're not a decision-making committee. So um, for your benefit and the benefit of all the speakers that brought this up, I direct your attention to two California Code of Regulations, Section 18,700 C2. It provides that a member, this is a member subject to the financial uh, provisions in the Political Reform Act, does not include an individual who performs duties as part of a committee board, commission, group, or other body that does not have decision-making authority. So the critical point here is that this is an advisory body, and so they're not subject to the same Political Reform Act financial restrictions that you would be familiar with. Um, I would also like to address um, something that a speaker raised about Government Code 1090. Um, this proposal um, does not, uh, it squares, I think the word was squares, it squares with Government Code 1090 because 1090 applies to conflicts in contracting and is not applicable to the nomination of persons to serve on an advisory committee. So um, those were the two conflicts laws that I think we were, that, that were being, that you've raised and that were raised by the members of the public. The Political Reform Act, which is the financial, uh, financial interest, and then the 
Government Code 1090 question, which relates to conflicts and contracting, neither one of them would be uh, an issue with this proposal. So just to summarize, the reason that there's no conflict of interest uh, legal concern um, is because, number one, the board is not, the, com the, PAC, the PAC board is not making any decisions around contracts. And number two, because they're not making any decisions at all, they're providing advice. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, that's um, that's super helpful. Um, I think this is, it's, uh, you know, I, I have to say, I think that this is one of those really interesting questions where what's on the surface, which is how this board is constructed, is sort of a, a proxy for what's really going on underneath. Um, and I think that if you look at the, the structure of the board, you know, the idea that we should have as a, as a board of supervisors advice from most of the advice should be from Carlsbad because it's mostly impacting Carlsbad, but helpful also to have some advice from Vista and San Marcos and other surrounding communities because the airport a little bit impacts those other communities. Um, and helpful to have mostly advice from community members, so eight of the seats are community seats, but also helpful to have some insights from um, individuals who understand the business operations of the airport. I think that from a standpoint of how would how would you comprise a body that would come up with sort of thoughtful, balanced um, analysis and insights that uh, weights most heavily the community that's most impacted, but also draws on um, advice from other surrounding communities as well as insights from from individuals who understand airport operations. I think the this is very logical. I think the way that this has been proposed is very logical. I think the question is, is this, how is this gonna operate in practice, right? Is it gonna be that the four, four or five of the seats that are supposed to be community seats actually end up being industry seats, even though they're uh, kind of categorized as community seats? Um, and so I think that gets to the, the next question that I've heard raised by constituents, which is, uh, concern about people just staying on indefinitely in these in these jobs and just that they're not being any term limits. So I, I think it would be helpful for me to better understand how these terms are going to be structured and these terms are going to be run, are, are going to run um, because I know that some people have been on the PAC board uh, for a real really long really long time. I think it's two questions, right? One is, uh, how are the terms structured? So once we pass this ordinance, are there gonna be, you know, five new, you know, is it gonna be all new appointments because I get four sp seats and then the CIA goes, gets a seat, so that's five new seats. And it, it, are we all gonna reappoint or, um, and then once those appointments are made, so that's kind of question one is, do we all get new appointments now? And then question two is, uh, can you just, uh, reappoint people who've been on uh, for a long time, or are there some kind of term limits? Uh, Supervisor Lawson, but thank you for that clarification. Now, it is a kind of a two-part question. One is the issue related to the um, appointment of members consistent with the ordinance. So what the ordinance says is it says the terms of the appointees run concurrently with the term of the nominating supervisors. So um, right now we have two appointments that have been made one for the city of Oceanside and one for Carlsbad that were made by, or nominated by District 5. Those were confirmed. Those persons will serve till January 4th, 2027. It's when uh, Supervisor Desmond's term ends. All the other terms are technically vacant and on holdover. So when this ordinance becomes effective in 30 days, well, after its enactment in March, then we'll, you'll have uh, additional appointments and Supervisor Desmond will have appointments and we'll have one by the CAO. So that's the process that will apply to, to filling the seats. Then there was this other issue that came up related to board policy A74, which provides that uh, persons will not serve for more than two terms. Um, the way that that's been interpreted and applied, it would mean that a supervisor could nominate somebody and then renominate that person. Uh, at the end of that term, a different supervisor could nominate that same person, but because of the effects of term limits and the application of A74, um, we're not going to have an issue with individuals being strictly limited unless it's the, the same supervisor, which, which really can't happen anymore because of term limits. Does, does that make sense? The first part made sense, but the second part did not make sense to me. Sorry. So, so what, what we were saying is that A74, um, which limits the, the terms of individuals that serve to two terms, 
would apply clearly if you had a circumstance where an individual supervisor could nominate somebody for more than two terms. But because of the effects of term limits, you can't, that can't happen anymore because no supervisor can serve for more than two terms. So what we could have, what I am saying, is that consistent with how A74 has been applied, is you could have a circumstance where a supervisor nominates somebody, renominates that same person, and then that supervisor's term ends, they're, not gonna, they're no longer gonna be able to serve on the Board of Supervisors, but you could have a circumstance where that person is now nominated to serve for a third term, but we've not applied A74 to prohibit um, service in that instance. It's applied to the nominations of an individual supervisor. Does that make sense? So to translate, the way that we've interpreted and applied A74 is that a supervisor cannot nominate someone for more than two consecutive terms. Not that a person cannot serve more than two consecutive terms. So it's a limitation on the appointment power of the supervisor. It's not a limitation on the serving uh, power of the individual being appointed. That is correct. So it sounds like maybe we might want to think about that. Just an uh, interesting way of applying uh, A74. So, but that's a broader question that doesn't have to do Absolutely. with the Palomar Airport. Um, this is very, very helpful. Um, so, sorry, so does that mean that um, the new supervisor can appoint a new person? It doesn't have to be the same person? It could, right? yeah. Okay, I just want to clarify that. Yep. Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? That the new supervisor, right, in the new term is allowed to uh, nominate whoever whoever they want. It doesn't have to be reappointment of that person. That, that is correct. Okay. Um, and although this is very interesting, this A74 question, because this impacts, right, all of our committees, not just the Palomar Airport. Is that correct? A74 does apply to committees broadly. Okay, yeah, interesting, interesting question. Um, for potentially another day, but certainly a, a, that's a very interesting uh, way of interpreting um, a term limit um, clause. Um, anyway, so thank you. I appreciate your clarifying questions. I've been asked a lot of these questions by constituents and um, you know, did my best to answer them, but I think uh, you did a better job than I could, so I appreciate that. Um, I think where I'm at with this is I am concerned that we have a PAC that's responsive to the community. Um, I think structurally this is logical, right? That we get four seats for Carlsbad community members, we get a seat for Vista, San Marcos, Oceanside, you know, that everyone kind of gets a little bit of a say in, in advising. Um, and then we have a voice for um, kind of a better understanding impacts on airport operations. I am, however, also very concerned that the PAC has not been a great voice um, historically in, in representing and advocating for the community at all. Uh, and I know that to be true. Um, so my hope is that this is gonna be a fresh start. There's gonna be six new appointment, no, seven, seven new appointments, seven out of nine. Um, and that we're gonna be able to have a fresh start coming at this from a much more, I think, holistic and grounded way of having um, advice and voices from the whole community. Um, but I would just want to say for the record, um, if we move this forward, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm prepared to support this, but if we move this forward and we have these seven new people and it still doesn't, um, it's still not being responsive to the community, we end up with a lot of bias and we're not really having community voices heard in a holistic way, I am going to be asking to revisit this um, because the proof will be in the pudding. So I'm willing to give this a try because I think it's very thoughtful, uh, but, you know, if it's not working, then I'll be coming back and asking my colleagues to to look at this uh, again. So, thank you. I'll second that motion. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, um, this is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, we're trying to do this in a fair way, but okay, I gotta, that airport was there in 1959. The housing tracks were built under the flight plan since then. It, it, that already existed. They haven't changed the runway, it already exists. And yes, there's more housing, yes, there's more people, and yes, there's more airplanes. But the airport was there first. So to say, I don't like, I bought my house near an airport and now there's airplane noise is, um, I kind of, I get, is, is hard to grasp. But I will take exception with uh, my uh, colleague here, um, Supervisor Lawson Reber, by stating multiple times the previous board was not responsive. And, and I think 
because I appointed all of them, so I have to take offense to that. But the, um, um, a lot of what, there's a lot of misunderstanding out there as to what this board can actually do. Uh, this board is, is an advisory to, to, the, to us, and they have very limited areas that they can explore. Uh, the FAA is, the, is where most of the complaints should be directed. They're the ones that, as soon as, I'm a 33-year airline pilot, th as, as soon as an airplane gets on the taxiway, they are under the control of the FAA. They are under the control of the FAA at Palomar Airport, because it's a tower-controlled airport. And so, once they're in the, and the, until they're in the air, and once they're in the air, they're all un, they're under the control of the FAA. Now, pilots do try to follow the voluntary noise abatement procedures. It's papered all over uh, Palomar Airport, the pot, pot flying schools, and everybody else sees those as voluntary noise abatement procedures. But if the FAA's got a whole bunch of traffic coming in, they may have to tell some aircraft, hey, turn left here now to, you know, to avoid hitting another airplane, things like that. So the PAC, the advisory committee has zero input to the FAA and zero impact to the FAA. And the FAA is going to come back with the answer is, we're just trying to do the safest thing possible. That's what, so this advisory committee, I think they've been very responsive in, in, in ways that they can and in, in advising the schools about, in, in advising about the voluntary noise abatement procedures. And I think they've been very um, responsive and I don't know how much more responsive they can get. If you really want to get responsive, go after your, con your congressional, per I mean, is it Congressman Levin's district? Uh, he, he's. He represents the federal government, the FAA. Um, and to the city of Vista and, and the other cities that make, they call them nominations, but they're really recommendations. And um, I've been involved with this airport committee for a long time. I actually was on the team that, it, that came up with the voluntary noise abatement program and, and impl implemented that, and, or actually got it designed to avoid uh, housing complexes and, and stay over the freeways and things like that. But. Um, Rarely, no other city in North County has the, that I'm aware of, has their um, city council nominate someone. It's a county airport. It's not a city of Vista airport. It's a county airport. And in the past, they just used to ask the mayor for a recommendation to be sort of, the, of these different cities to be on the uh, airport advisory committee. And, and if, I, it may be Oceanside, but Vista is the first one that's kind of taken a full, full bent to uh, make a, they say a nomination, but it's really a recommendation. And I get other applicants other than the city of Vista's uh, uh, app recommendation. So um, I did want somebody that had aviation experience, and so I apologize for that. Not really. Um, but anyway, I, I appreciate, you know, and as, as my colleague has said, if this doesn't work out, we can change it later. But it's, I think it's a good first step. It's, it's, um, equitable, I think, between the two districts um, and uh, keeps the deciding vote out of our hands uh, for the ninth, ninth seat. And um, let's give it a shot. But know that, you know, if you, the, um, that advisory panel can, um, has little, little effect on the FAA, unfortunately. And, and they do will work with the flight schools and, and the people on the ground to try to keep things as quiet as possible. Uh, they, so anyway. Um, with that, I'll be quiet. I got a motion. <laughs> I'll need the second. Thank you. So, I just one more thing to say. Um, I, I think what is important just to, to center is that it is an advisory body. Um, so, that is really key. And if there's decisions that need to be made, it's not, they're not being made by this, uh, by the PAC. Um, it, 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 most of the decisions, as, uh, as my colleague mentioned, um, or sit with the FAA, but to the extent that there are decisions that are local, those are up to, to us as a board. So um, I will have no uh, concerns about overriding the recommendations of the PAC if I think it's biased. So I also would put that out there. I think that's, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're the deciding, we're the decision makers. All right, with that, we have a motion in a second, but I want to make sure that I turn it over to our clerk so that he can highlight some of the changes in the ordinance so that it's on record. Okay? Just And just to clarify, the, the intent of the motion is in, to include the, the staff recommendation to also add that language that was omitted inadvertently. Yeah. Correct. Thank you. With that, we have a motion and a second, and no further discussion. Please vote. 
And Chairwoman Rourke, as that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present, voting aye. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Appreciate all the work. Uh, the next item on the agenda is item number 12, uh, notice public hearing ordinance amendments to the grading clearing and water course ordinance. Uh, I'm going to have you turn over to the public for thank, comment. Thank you, Chairman Vargas. We have five total requests to speak, all coming via phone. I'd also like to note for the record, we did not receive any e-comments on this item. For any m members of the public that requested to speak on this item by phone, if you could please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you, and we will give you a moment to do so. We will now hear from those that have requested to speak by phone. Again, when it's your turn to speak, you'll be unmuted. Then you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I'd like to remind the callers they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. And we'll go ahead and begin with our first caller. Hold a bold. Uh, uh, let's see. The exemptions on the proposed revised ordinance. Uh, at I read grading or reclamation work pursuant to a use permit or reclamation plan. Dot dot dot. The routine road maintenance activities. Uh, dot dot dot. Are ministerial and therefore exempt from the CQA. Dot, dot, dot. And I again read are ministerial and therefore exempt from California Environmental Quality Act. Dot, dot, dot. I do not know who is proofreading these, but it clearly needs revision. Um, let's see. Um, subsection I, temporary stockpiling of earth coming immediately after G, the D, H, and also in a separate paragraph. Subsection H are ministerial and therefore exempt as repeated, but not be. Uh, please revise these four errors before resubmitting, and if you cut it, you too pass the test. Again, it is settled hail and unnecessary to publish a summary with names of board members voting for and against is in newspaper general circulation. If one is that curious, it's in the mix. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next speaker. A strip a funny line in the errata. Stockpiling of earth. I feel like there's some totalitarians that dream of that goal. Once again, this item is an example of the county making itself an anti-real housing jurisdiction by treating single-family homes the same as commercial centers, requiring grading permits for soil movement, while big back and back developers get to avoid that pay-to-play process. And as admitted in this item, quote, the ordinance may impact a housing project's processing time and cost, end quote. So much for being pro-housing. The only way to really be pro-housing is to start ignoring mandates from the state, ignore all the frivolous fees demanded, environmental impact reviews, and preferred development requirements, and then the only issue would be the state threatening fees and lawsuits. But hey, you'd actually meet the RENA numbers. Regardless, not requiring a grading permit for required setbacks and maximum slopes, does that mean certain developments won't ensure that anymore? Or is there still an oversight on the de development? I think it's good to not require a grading permit for routine road maintenance like filling potholes. Well, that's not so routine, though. But I know it's just going to benefit those ugly, sustainable slate grade stacking back. It was 150000 for project management, meetings, stakeholder engagement, and outreach, research, and analysis. Still not as good of a deal as my $10 Mexican shoes worth 1400 pesos. But I'd love to see you guys continue to spend the people's money at that low rate. But sure, I'm glad that the revised version of this item included sustainability statement. What would we have done if the county staff had forgotten that? I mean, I would have pointed out, but also someone could have gasped in shock and emitted too much carbon, and we can't have that. 
I think after this ordinance takes effect and a summary is then published with the names of the board members voting for and against it in the San Diego Commerce, a newspaper that nobody's ever heard of or could even find a copy of, not that I'm even old enough to know what a newspaper is, I think it should be included how many of the people were in support and how many were in opposition. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next speaker. Man, it's like it would be good if one day you guys didn't get in the way of just providing the things that the people need. And, like, you'll sit here and you'll like, seek to exempt things. You know, like, sometimes that's not equitable, you know, and that's not inclusive when you're doing that. And I feel like that's going against what you guys are, you know, promoting. Um, because it's like some people need to go through all those who others don't. And they're the only reasons why we're not having any housing. You're never going to make up and get all the housing that you need because you're always going to be in your own way. It's actually really sad. And the fact that you think that you would um, put out trees because they absorb oxygen, <laughs> why would you do that? You don't want people to breathe. It's like, is that what you actually think, that they absorb it? Because then the more you put up, it's like there's less oxygen. <laughs> anyway, it's just funny to see how you guys work because... It's just, it doesn't make any sense, like, in a real-world type of, like, reality. Everything that you guys do is upside down and inside out. It totally contradicts, like, being able to get, you know, things um, that need to be done. And then you're just always, like, blaming somebody else. It's like, even for the storm infrastructure and stuff like that, you know? And so you'll do things that actually impact housing projects. <laughs> oh, well, you're like, we're trying to provide this. It's going to be good. We need to provide, you know, the big old density project, but, like, other ones, I don't know. So we're going to seek to exempt these ones and not those. Those are my friends. I want them to really get this money in their pockets for this project. So uh, it's like if one day there was a board or some, like, you know, government entity to actually work for the people. <laughs> I don't think that's possible because that's not why you guys were created. It wasn't. It was to just, like, destroy everything. So, I mean, you do good at it. You know, Satan is super proud, like I told you. Yeah. He's sneaky snakes. He calls you. Because he's like, you're just like me. It's great. It's good. You know, I mean, you guys are, you know, going to have a special warm. Thank you. Your time is up. And Chairwoman Vargas, that concludes public comment on this item. And I'd also like to note for the record that we received an errata for this item as well that makes revisions to attachment A. Thank you very much. Uh, Supervisor Desmond. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you. I want to thank Davi and, and your team of PDS uh, here today for returning with this item uh, from the board's uh, direction is actually last May. Um, that the, the housing projects that are allowed by right should also have their grading allowed by right as well, and that, which is what this amendment makes clear. And I think that just, it should have been that in there in the first place, but it wasn't, so that's how government works. But anyway, uh, so I'm glad to see that, that this was in there, but it's gonna reduce time and cost for home builders, uh, which they desperately need. And, you know, I just wanna note that the reduction in time and cost as well as the predictable element that this change brings this should also be needed for housing projects across the board. Uh, so um, those, not even those that are not allowed by right. But this is a good start, to the, and I'm happy to make a motion to recommend item 12. Okay, thank you. Oh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Supervisor Montgomery, step. Supervisor Anderson beat me to it. Um, thank you so much for the, the work on this. I think just the clarification will open up uh, new opportunities to streamline um, housing developments as I guess the buy right uh, classification was supposed to do in the first place. So um, thank you uh, for bringing this forward and for this clarification, for balancing the need for environmental mitigation with the social needs for housing um, and obviously the crisis that we face right now in San Diego. Thank you very much and I support the item. Okay, seeing no other comments, we have a motion and a second, please vote. And Chairwoman Vargas, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present voting aye. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is notice item number 13, notice public hearing feasibility analysis of tiered winery expansion and associated exemption to the California Environmental Quality Act. I'm gonna uh, hand the floor over to our county team for presentation. Right. Well, we'll wait for them to get here.
Good morning. Me. Good morning, Chairman Vargas and members of the board. I'm Rami Telly. Today, Tara Lieberman, Donald Chase, and I will be presenting on an analysis of the tiered winery ordinance. In July of 2021, the board directed staff to explore the feasibility of expanding tiered winery regulations and classifications beyond the existing agricultural areas to additional zones and to return to the board with options to implement. This direction stemmed from both current and prospective winery operators who expressed a desire to expand winery opportunities, reduce startup costs, and simplify the permitting process. Today, we'll be discussing the background of the tiered winery ordinance, the feasibility of expanding and streamlining winery operations, and options for the board's consideration, which include option one, expanding into rural residential zones only. Option two, which builds upon option one and also expands into rural, commercial, industrial, and specific plan zones. And option three, which establishes a winery district overlay zone. A winery district overlay zone would be a designated area where specific regulations and guidelines are implemented to support and regulate the establishment and operation of wineries and related activities. We'll be going over these options in more detail later in the presentation. In 2010, the board adopted the tiered winery ordinance, establishing four distinct classifications for wineries in agricultural zones, based on factors like size, design, location, and operational characteristics. Each classification has its own permitting process tailored to its level of impact, with less review for lower impact classifications and more review for those identified with impacts. Two of these classifications, wholesale limited, and boutique cater to smaller wineries producing less than 12,000 gallons of wine annually. The main difference between them is that the boutique classification allows tasting rooms and on-site sales to the public, while the wholesale limited classification does not. Compared to larger facilities, they have fewer permitting requirements. The other two classifications, small wineries and wineries, accommodate larger scale operations and may include provisions for special events. Due to their scale, they require a more comprehensive permitting process to ensure their location, size, design, and operations align with the surrounding land uses and the environment. The streamlining benefits that wineries can take advantage of in agricultural zones under the existing ordinance include a ministerial approval of wine production within the wholesale limited winery classification. Often referred to as buy right permits, ministerial permits do not involve any discretion and are approved by staff if the project complies with all applicable regulations and ordinances. Ministerial approval of on-site tasting and direct sales to the public within the boutique winery classification and reduced discretionary review for medium scale winery operations under the small winery classification. This allows for larger specialty events on site under a defined limitation with approval of an administrative permit. No changes were proposed to the largest winery classification, which is allowed with an approval of a major use permit. The tiered winery ordinance expansion project follows a phased approach. The first phase focused on a feasibility analysis report to identify potential locations to streamline and allow new wineries. This report summarizes the local history of wine production in the county, provides an overview of current trends and best practices within the wine industry, and includes a market and economic analysis. The analysis combined with this information with key takeaways from stakeholders, stakeholder outreach, to explore the potential expansion of winery operations into various unincorporated areas. As a component of the feasibility analysis, staff have developed a range of options for the board's consideration for potential expansion into the tiered winery ordinance. If directed by the board, the second phase of this effort would involve preparing environmental documentation, ordinance amendments, and establishing performance criteria, thresholds, and buffers to address what we heard from stakeholders. The feasibility analysis explored several key factors, including a comparison to national trends, the potential for growth, the role of smaller wineries, the viability of smaller vineyards, and the influence of population growth on the wine industry in San Diego County. Here are some of the main takeaways from the analysis. 
Smaller wine regions across the county have displayed more resilience compared to the broader nationwide history, industry. Excuse me. San Diego County stands out with its array of smaller wineries focusing on premium wines, a segment that continues to enjoy sustained popularity. This positioning provides San Diego County with the potential to deviate from national trends and realize increased sales both in short and long term. The presence of numerous smaller wineries and retail wine tasting rooms in our county is a significant factor. Many of these establishments emphasize premium offerings, contributing not only to potential increased sales, but also serving as a platform for introducing new grape varieties and showcasing the unique characteristics of regional wines. Smaller part-time and hobby vineyards can be viable for individuals not solely reliant on these operations for immediate profitability. While both large and small vineyard owners face operational and financial pressures, the smaller operations play a vital role in fostering the growth of the wine industry. Looking ahead, the overall population growth in San Diego County area emerges as a significant driver for increased demand for wine and grapes from our local operations. For engagement efforts, staff divided information, provided information to our ex external stakeholders on the projects and collected feedback on the feasibility analysis results, draft options, and how stakeholders would be engaged as the effort moves forward. We have met with community planning and sponsor group chairs, small working groups such as the Farm Bureau and Environmental Coalition and other external agencies, and held two public webinars. Staff received input and comment letters from various stakeholders, including support from the Farm Bureau on option one as a starting point and support from the winery operators on creating a path forward for future expansion opportunities. Residents emphasized concerns such as increased traffic on roads and restricted access to water. If directed by the board, phase two of the project will include a thorough analysis of potential environmental impacts surrounding these themes. Winery owners expressed support for expanding the winery tiers and address challenges related to the permitting process. In response to these comments, staff will continue to improve the permitting process by creating winery pre-application checklists and update the winery FAQ guide. These tools will act as a comprehensive guide, detailing the necessary steps for establishing each type of winery, outlining the permit requirements, and addressing environmental impact considerations and offering procedural guidance to aid applicants. Input received has been incorporated into the updated feasibility analysis. This map shows the existing 157 wineries of all types and sizes throughout the unincorporated county. Concentrations of wineries can be found in Fallbrook, Valley Center, Ramona, Warner Springs, and Hamul. Based on the findings of the feasibility analysis and stakeholder feedback, Staff has developed a variety of options to enhance winery operations in alignment with the board's guidance. The three options present increasingly more opportunities for wineries, but also increase time and cost to prepare. Option one would modify the existing tiered winery ordinance, which currently only allows for smaller winery operations in agricultural zones to expand to allow for wholesale limited, boutique, and small wineries into rural residential zones. This would be subject to an administrative permit process, provided that all relevant criteria are satisfied. Once fully funded, PDS could initiate the effort with an anticipated duration of 14 to 16 months, an estimated cost of $700,000, and an addendum to the Agricultural Promotion Program EIR. Applicants could begin utilizing this opportunity immediately after adoption of the updated tiered winery ordinance. This map shows the location of expansion opportunities into rural residential zones for option one. Option two builds upon option one, allowing expansion into rural residential zones, but with addi additional opportunities into residential commercial, industrial, and specific plan zones. This option addresses the feasibility analysis in allowing small and large winery operators to expand beyond wine production to a range of agricultural entertainment-oriented businesses, such as tasting rooms, which could represent an opportunity to significantly increase overall returns on investment. 
This would be subject to an administrative permit process, provided that all relevant criteria are satisfied. Once fully funded, PDS could initiate the effort with an anticipated duration of 16 to 20 months with an estimated cost of $1.25 million and a supplemental EIR. This map shows the location of expansion opportunities into rural residential, residential commercial, industrial, and specific plan zones for option two. The third option would establish winery district overlay zones. A winery district overlay would apply an additional layer of standards to all areas within a defined overlay boundary, regardless of the underlying zoning. This substantially expands on the board's initial directive and provides specific areas covered by a programmatic EIR to broaden the opportunities for applicants to actively pursue a wine vineyard or associated winery uses within specific thresholds and guidelines. The identification of the overlay zones would be a part of phase two. The benefit of this approach is that it would allow for more concentrations of wineries in more locations and lower initial costs for applicants. Once fully funded, PDS could initiate the effort with an anticipated programmatic EIR taking approximately 20 to 26 months and an estimated cost of 1.75 million. Benefits for each option are as follows. Option one would expand the acreages available to the winery industry. Option two unlocks off-site tasting rooms as a business expansion opportunity. And option three creates a concentration of wineries to encourage multiple visits to more than one destination within the same area. Challenges for all options include requiring wineries to prepare environmental review documents, completing an administrative permit, and needing outside technical assistance with engineering and design. If directed by the board, the second phase of this effort would involve expanding the tiered winery ordinance. This phase would include the preparation of associated environmental analysis and relevant technical studies. Additionally, as part of phase two, performance criteria, thresholds, and buffers would be established to ensure siting and compatibility to adjacent land uses to address what we heard from stakeholders. Today, staff recommends that the board find the analysis report exempt from CEQA, receive the tiered winery expansion feasibility analysis report, and consider the options to expand and streamline winery operations, and lastly, to provide staff direction on next steps for phase two of the project. This concludes our presentation, and we are available to answer questions. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and turn over for public comment, and then we'll have discussion. Thank you, Chairman Vargas. We have 18 total requests to speak, 10 individuals in person, and eight requesting to speak by phone. Also, like to note for the record, we did receive 62 e-comments on this item. 52 were in favor, eight were in opposition, and one was neutral. For any members of the public that have requested to speak on this item by phone, if you could please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speakers. As your name is called, if you could please come forward and stand against the east wall under the murals until it is your turn to speak. I will be calling individuals in groups of five. And I'd like to invo invite forward the following individuals. Andy, Michael, Elizabeth Edwards, Peter, and Michael, I believe it's Dewin. You'll have two minutes to address the board, and if you could please begin by stating your name for the record. Good morning, supervisors. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Andy Lyle. I am the chair of the Land Use Committee at the San Diego County Farm Bureau. The Farm Bureau represents farming interests in the county, and we are supportive of the expansion uh, of this ordinance because it increases opportunities for winemakers and vineyard owners in San Diego. A thriving wine industry is an important part of the fabric for San Diego County, and it gives our communities local options for wine tasting and entertainment. Vineyards and wineries provide a beautiful landscape, local wine supply, carbon sequestration, and agritourism opportunities. I believe it is important that we encourage the development of wineries and vineyards by removing burdensome regulations, which are time consuming and costly. Investors need the county to provide a clear picture of the costs and regulations involved before development begins. 
At this point, I am in support of option one, which would allow permitted wineries to expand into rural residential zones. This is a logical first step because it provides the quickest and cheapest expansion uh, of the ordinance. Options two and three might be worth exploring in the future as San Diego's wine industry grows. I'd like to finish by thanking county staff for uh, their work and engagement on this ordinance, and I look forward to working on this together in the future. The San Diego County Farm Bureau is here to be a helpful resource as uh, this work continues. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Vargas and board. I'm Mike Milano. I'm a third generation cut flower farmer, past president of San Diego County Farm Bureau, and a budding and emerging grape grower and vintner. Um, I want to thank the board first for allowing this to come forward for staff to evaluate. And I really want to thank staff for an exemplary job in doing an analysis of the industry, what's out there, and what the possibilities and potential is. Job well done. Uh, with that, I am speaking in support of expanding the ordinance to rural residential, um, primarily uh, focusing on option one at this point in time, but reserving option two and option three for future endeavors as the industry matures and grows. We all know in San Diego County that at this point in time, agriculture is facing a number of challenges, whether it's water, labor, uh, crop protection materials. There are numerous challenges that we can see the landscape of the county changing through the loss of avocado groves, loss of citrus. What we have in front of us, though, is an emerging industry that has the opportunity to grow and expand and create a new identity for San Diego County. Every time I go around a new corner in, in the North County region, it seems like I'm seeing a new vineyard. I'm seeing a new operation. All those operations are going to need to have a place to send their products or to allow their products to be made into something for the consumer. What we do know direct experience is co consumer engagement with agriculture is expanding. People want to get out on farms, they want to visit farms, they want to engage in agritourism. That component should be nurtured, expanded, and focused on not only for vintning and for, for winemaking and vintners, but for the greater agricultural community as we go forward. Thank you very much. As one of the founding authors who helped draft the tiered winery ordinance, and I'm also an owner of a boutique winery, I'm in favor also of the phase one expanded areas. However, not with amplified music and current levels of bulk wines. The smallest of the small boutique wineries are by right of zoning, and that's slowly being corrupted. A small number of wineries hosted illegal amplified bands, not soft acoustic background music. Some sold tickets and parked more than 50 vehicles. A petition to, sort, to support these illegal activities has been circulated without input from neighbors who were forced to hear music every weekend. How would anyone like that? And if vineyards can host bands, why can't all farms every weekend? Maybe this is a wake-up call to consider acreage minimums. Temecula requires discretionary permits and a 10-acre minimum for any wineries offering tastings, and that is without bans. The original ordinance required 75% of the grapes to be grown on premises. A few complainers got it reduced to only 25% needing to be grown at the vineyard. 75% is not even allowable by our ABC license. The extra 25% is supposed to only be sold wholesale. We need to keep real farms viable to help balance out urban sprawl by growing larger vineyards, so I'm in favor of this expansion, but not ban stages and parking lots. We, we need the carbon sequestration from vines. We need to rethink limiting the amount of bulk wines being trucked in and deceptively being served to the public. This will ensure that agricultural pursuits are the primary focus in our agricultural neighborhoods. Thank you. Ma'am, would you mind stating your name for the record? Elizabeth Edwards. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Michael Dwyer. I want to thank the board and staff for allowing me to speak. 
Uh, I'm speaking in favor of the tiered winery ordinance expansion, but I would like to speak directly to um, amending and clarifying an ordinance allowing amplified live music at boutique wineries. Uh, I'm a professional musician making my living performing throughout Southern California. To my knowledge, amplified music at the boutique wineries has never approached a decibel level that exceeds the noise ordinance already in place. The vast share of musical acts performing at the wineries are soloists, duos, and trios. Seldom do the wineries host full bands with instrumentation that might exceed the noise ordinance already in place. As a vocalist and guitarist singing and playing guitar without some form of modest amplification to a large area is harmful to my voice. My voice and guitar are my tools I use for uh, my livelihood. After performing a three hour show without amplification, striving to reach people sitting 50 feet away from the stage area, it leaves my voice hoarse, which directly affects my next performance opportunity. I believe clarity needs to be put in place regarding this issue, and I implore the board to vote in favor of amending the boutique winery ordinance where amplified music events are concerned. Thank you. And then the next speaker's coming. I'll call the next five speakers. Ashley Nortor, Natalie Rose Phillips, Robert Kreisak, Eric Goforth, and Victoria Bradley. You begin your call. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Peter Bidigan, and I just have a simple observation I wanted to share with you. And that is um, a business that I own on Main Street. It is a beer and wine uh, venue, tasting venue. Been there seven years. And in the very beginning, uh, I noticed a renaissance occurring in the music industry uh, in and around the wine region of Ramona. Uh, quite a phenomenon because in the last seven years, I've seen it grow um, a lot. And the customers that come into my venue have already always uh, suggested to me um, mainly that they wanted to experience the, uh, the music in the wine industry and they weren't sure where to go. One of the advantages we have on uh, Main Street is we represent over 14 wineries and we're very well uh, acquainted with the owners <clears throat> and they really appreciate the fact that maybe I could direct them during the week uh, when we're open and they're not uh, where they could go to listen to music. It's just been growing every year, and we're at the point now where it's, um, I think it's time for the musicians to have their voices be heard and let them uh, have amplified music at these uh, wine establishments. Um, but I just want to let you know, it's been quite the experience, and we're very, very uh, excited about the future of the entertainment in the uh, wine region of Ramona. Thank you very much. I can sing anywhere, but I'm nervous to speak. <laughs> my name is Ashley E. Norton, local Ramona musician. These are not my words. From the oldest times, people sang for many reasons. They sang so their crops would be plentiful or so that their hunt would be good. They sang to show their community spirit and they sang to celebrate. And that's the singing we're talking about. Aren't we told in Psalm 149, to praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song. Let them praise his name in the dance. And it was King David. King David, who we read about in Samuel. And what did David do? David danced before the Lord with all of his might, leaping and dancing before the Lord. There is a time to every purpose under, he under heaven, a time to laugh and a time to weep. There is a time to mourn and there is a time to dance. There is a time for this law, but not anymore. And this is our time, our time to celebrate life. That's the way it was in the beginning, the way it has always been. That's the way it should be now. That speech is from Footloose, released in 1984. It's, I, I did change the wording from dance to sing, and it still applies. We're not asking for rock concerts. We're simply asking for appropriate amplified acoustic music under the decibel limitations that already exist in the county. Thank you for listening.
Hello, good morning. I'm going to be reading. I'm a little nervous and I don't want to mess it up. So uh, good morning to the supervisors. Thanks for having us. Um, my name is Natalie Rose Phillips and I'm a multiple business owner in Ramona. And uh, it too is very small. I have a salon and a brewery. And um, I do support all of the small businesses in Ramona and that includes the wineries. Um, I want to see access for all and I'm excited about the possibilities of amending this ordinance so that the small boutique wineries will be able to have music. It's not a concert, it's not loud, it's not a ton of cars, it's just acoustic music. Um, so we wanted to also say um, if these wineries, if these wineries cannot have music, I'm afraid the wineries aren't gonna su succeed and uh, we'll lose our beautiful wineries in Ramona. Um, so uh, again, it's not a concert. It's not, I don't even think the neighbors have even complained. It's nothing has been too loud or too busy. Just want you guys to know. Thanks for your time and uh, your consideration of changing this ordinance. Good morning, Chairperson Vargas, members of the board. My name is Bob Kreisak, and I am the president of the Ramona Chamber of Commerce. I'm here to tell you today that the Chamber of Commerce and, in Ramona and the business community of Ramona strongly supports expanding the uh, boutique winery ordinance to allow for amplified music at the wineries. Ramona has enjoyed a renaissance of cultural development over the past years through its art, its wineries, and the uh, burgeoning music industry. There is a symbiotic relationship between the wineries and our musicians in our town, and they have together been providing entertainment to Ramona for a long time now. We in Ramona appreciate the existence of the wine ordinance as it has allowed Ramona to put itself on the map as a wine region, rivaling Temecula. We have an excess of 40 wineries in Ramona. The winery ordinance has been in effect for years now. There are practical experience and on the ground experience that we've enjoyed. We would like the county to consider revising the winery ordinance to allow for limited amplified music at boutique wineries. We fully understand the sensitivity of the subject uh, of amplification because the wineries are general and residential in neighborhoods. Certainly decibel levels exist which could be abided by. Wineries are limited hour venues. They have to close at sundown and even on weekends. So it's not an imposition in the evening hours. In just three weeks, we have assembled over 2,000 signatures on a petition to allow for amplified music in Ramona and more will come. The signers support amending the current winery ordinance to allow for live acoustical performances aided by appropriate sound reinforcement at boutique wineries limited by an acceptable decibel level at property edge. Thank you for considering this. Thank you. Good afternoon. First, I want to thank you all for your dedication to public service and the hard work in, in doing this assessment. It's, a, it's an important issue for our community. I'm from Ramona. Um, the current ordinance, is, as it's written, simply states prohibited outdoor amplified music. The spirit, of the, the spirit of the ordinance, I think, was in good nature. Nobody wants to hold a Coachella Fest at a winery in Ramona. So we understand that, but there's a safety issue as it relates to our musicians when they're trying to perform. As Mr. Dwyer stated earlier, it is very difficult to project a singing voice to anything other than about 10 feet around you. So moderate amplification is a, is a good thing and it's a safety concern for our musicians. Being outdoors is the only other issue there because music in itself is not explicitly prohibited on our wineries. So amplified music, I can invite the entire Royal Scots bagpipe band. They are not amplified, it's just the way they are. I know our, aim, our I assume our neighbors would not want to hear that all day long. So just reasonable understanding of what outdoor amplified music is, understanding that there is already an ordinance in place for decibel levels and allow the wineries to do that. Being outdoors is critical. We all know that it's the way we socialize. We all spend a year being forced not to socialize 
And I think we're all much happier being able to be in a space together, in gather together, and then rejoice with your community, celebrate, and uh, stuff like that. So I'm asking you to make sure all of these are considered. Let the community gather. Let them celebrate. As I see the big stage being erected right outside this building, my heart smiles. This weekend, there's going to be a lot of smiles, a lot of hugs, and a lot of people rejoicing with their community and celebrating as a group. And our wineries provide our community a place for our people to gather. And I thank you for the consideration as we look at all of the ordinance. Thank you. Sir, so would you mind stating your name for the record? Yes, I'm, I'm Eric Goforth. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Victoria Bradley. I own Ramona Family Naturals Market uh, for the last 18 years uh, in Ramona, or oh, sorry, since 2008. Um, I'm here in support, sorry, I'm short, um, in support of amending the tiered winery ordinance to allow boutique wineries to host live music within the current decibel levels that the county already enforces. Um, I attended the meetings. Um, when the ordinance was first being drafted, just to ensure that the wineries could have food on hand, because that was my business. Um, but music was not as much of a consideration then. Um, I think after COVID, people were hungry for connection and entertainment. And I definitely noticed that at my business, at, at my market. Um, we have, my market has directly benefited from the local boutique wineries. Um, we've seen an increase over the past few years of people all over San Diego County coming up to enjoy the wineries. And they often, they pick up food at my place um, and then they ask us, well, do you know any wineries that are having music today? Who's got live music today? So it, it definitely makes a, a difference and the word is getting out and people know that it's happening and, and that's what they want. Um, I also own a short-term rental in Ramona, and that's also benefited from the boutique wineries, um, as well as the wineries that have, you know, weddings and, and things like that. Um, but I get people from LA, Orange County, you know, San Diego, all coming up to stay in Ramona for the wineries specifically. Um, and finally, as a backcountry resident, um, I live near five boutique wineries and have never heard any complaints from neighbors about noise from a boutique winery. So thank you for attention to this matter. Thank you. We will now hear from those that have requested to speak by phone. When it's your turn to speak, you'll be unmuted. You will hear a recording that will tell you to get, begin your comments after the beep. Again, I'd like to remind the callers they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. And we'll begin with our first caller. It's truth. Uh, I think you supervisors tend to bring a lot of wine to conversation, so I decided to bring the cheese for balance. First, for those of you who mentioned the need for community connection because of the lockdown era, do you people realize you're talking to the people who locked it down and demanded you stay home? Do you not see the problem with that? Anyways, we've got more pay-to-play schemes going on with a tiered winery ordinance. I'm always down for more business opportunities, but not so much government opinion, permission, or extortion on the matter. And I like what I just mentioned. It was interesting to learn that there's a California Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control. Is, is there anything they don't try to control? As Adam says, there's double the money in wine than there is in beer. I think that's just because people are willing to pay more, not that they're drinking less beer. I'm actually going to recommend that the county goes a healthier option and begins to consider matcha production in the mountainous areas. It's full of good stuff for your brain, looks nice, tastes good, and it's really expensive. So if it was grown locally instead of being imported, maybe that price could come down. But outside of my personal tea dreams, what sells for others is people getting drunk and government collecting the taxes off government. Option one will cost $700,000. Option two will cost $1.2 million. Option three would cost $1.7 million and creates winery district overlay zones. I think that option sounds like an expensive utopian pipe dream, like maybe somebody had a glass too many. Because of the economic downward spiral we're on, essentially trying to create a winery area for tourists sounds unrealistic unless it already had an existing foundation and it doesn't, like other areas. As far as a simple solution to any residential concerns, especially about amplified music, just require a buffer distance. Real simple. Get them away from homes, schools, places of worship, neighborhoods, directly across and there should be less issues but whatever the decision it's going to cost at least seven hundred thousand i'd much rather spend that on a stockpile of matcha 
and the fight mentions outreach so i know stakeholders but very little real community input so i say thank you your time is up we'll go to our next speaker uh so yeah kind of ditto to bless you, bless you. kind of ditto to everything that um truth was just saying and i yeah these people don't realize who they're asking because yep same people who locked them down in the first place um the reality is yeah the, the future generations won't be able to afford wine there's the option and yeah it's a dumbed down society that is not paying attention and that is allowing for this local government and the federal government to do whatever the hell it wants um so yeah just a more more waste of uh, taxpayer money and time and yeah i wasn't really paying attention to this item i'm multitasking here um and so okay uh, last one okay anyways i'm done <laughs> thank you and we'll go to our next caller Hi everyone, my name is Sam Bates and I'm a resident of the breathtaking part of our county called Ramona. I really want to take, thank you for your time and consideration as I speak in support of the wineries having live music. Ramona has struggled with a reputation and with the recent growth of boutique wineries, it feels like it's finally changing. We're no longer just a place to pass through to get to Julian. We are now a place of beauty where people can sit and enjoy each other's company in the soft breeze on a typical sunny day, listening to someone singing songs. I hear people talk about amplified music, and I want to say that the music performed at the wineries is quiet enough for people at tables to be able to have conversations. It's through these conversations I've gained many friends from within my community. Sorry, I have something in my throat. <laughs> um, through these venues, we've been able to get to know each other from Ramona, San Diego, and all over the world. When friends and family visit, I take them out to one of our boutique wineries, and they leave with such a delightful impression of this part of San Diego County. It would be very appreciated if the wineries could have the opportunity to have live acoustic performances to enhance the experience and encourage community engagement within our growing music alliance. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Casey Lynch. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak today, Chair Vargas and the fellow members of the board. Uh, my name is Casey Lynch. I'm the chairman of the Ramona Community Planning Group, and today I'm speaking as an individual uh, in support of, I think, option two is a great idea to expand our tiered winery ordinance into other zones while allowing the current zones to continue operating under the tiered winery ordinance as boutique, small, or major wine winery. Uh, secondly, as an individual, I'd like to voice support for what you're hearing today in terms of an immediate change to the boutique winery ordinance portion. Um, <clears throat> PDS 586 is a little unclear in terms of providing information to these uh, by right uses in terms of music, and I think we need to support an immediate change. Uh, the two sections I'm proposing to be changed would be 6910B6 and 6910B11, which would allow for events such as music performances and for outdoor amplified music. Uh, supervisors, this is a case of where the law just has not caught up to the public's desire to use these facilities. I'd like you to support maybe an immediate action. We, we could direct PDS into looking into allowing amplified music over the next 30 days, come back to you with some suggestions on how to change those two sections of the tiered winery ordinance. So that way we can actually have some results that can help these boutique winery owners in our community of Ramona. I'm also going to be bringing this to our Ramona Community Planning Group on the 7th, where we're going to talk about my ideas for changing this ordinance, which would include leveling the playing field, allowing for sheriff's licensing permitting process, and compliance with the noise abatement ordinance. So thank you for allowing me to have my comments today. That's it. Thank you. We'll go to our next speaker. Hi, good morning. My name is Pam Gensler. 
Um, I just kind of decided to do this on the fly, so I'll make it quick. Uh, real quick to Mr. Desmond regarding the low-flying planes controlled by the FAA. That's true. But the noise at wineries in residential areas is 100% controlled by the county of San Diego and the laws of the state and the county. The night sky and the view sheds have been ignored. Topography has been ignored. I support the agriculture and winery, winery tourism. We live in Fallbrook, and we've allowed, you've allowed, Montserrat Winery, which isn't a winery, it's an event center with up to 600 events a year. And we have bingo, we have comedians, we have dance concerts, we have weddings, we have receptions, we have DJs and live music. Our home is 2,000 feet away from the, um, from the winery. We have sent in numerous videos of the noise and the sound that echoes throughout our house, inside and out. And myself and numerous neighbors have had this happen. Again, it's not against the winery. If it was a winery alone and, un and unplugged music and a small restaurant, that's fine. Or, you know, but you have to also look at the topography. The winery is at an elevation of 350 feet. Every house in the valley here is 500 to 600 feet elevation. So no matter what you do, the sound is going to rise. So this shouldn't have been permitted in the first place. Um, so, again, we have uh, uh, um, lights. There's 40, 20-foot lights uh, that blare all the time. Um, you worry about environmental and animal, and our quality of life has been destroyed because of this. And it, it's an ongoing concern. And again, for musicians, we say they need speakers to sing and such like that. Okay, but, again, why do I have to hear it if I'm 2,000 feet away? Thank you. Your time is up. We'll go to our next speaker. You're not very consistent, Nora, with allowing people to laugh like that because you kick us out for doing that. It's pretty ridiculous. Um, so, you know, anytime you're trying to put something in a residential area, it's like, are you even, you'll talk to stakeholders, but you're not talking to the actual people in the areas that are being affected and impacted by, you know, having a winery in there. And it's not just noise, but it's drunk driving. Are you going to, you know, be mitigating that, putting, you know, children at risk? Um, by having these in residential areas. What about water restrictions and, you know, the possibilities of the people not being able to use all the water that they need um, because of uh, winery being in the neighborhood? And then also just the impacts on the roads and different things like that that the homeowners are then, if they're in a private area, are going to have to take care of themselves. And, you know, so it's, it's your, you know, wanting to do certain things, and I understand, like, because you do want small businesses and you, winery is good for you, but when you're putting it in a residence, that's impacting those people, and they may not all be in line with you. And just because you are, you know, doesn't mean that you should be impacting these people just because you want it there. Maybe you could find another place to have it. And, you know, it's like, it's just bad to see that, you know, there'll be things that will come in and it affects people. And, you know, there'll be a big, some other group of people that come in and are just like, well, we need it anyway. You know, we're also in the community. Yeah, well, there's others in the community that may not like it. And you can't just be like, well, then move. I mean, because you could move the winery and you don't need to be putting people in danger by having people drunk driving and promoting that in the residential areas. Um, it's negligent. And, um, you know, just to impact the um, residents like that when they aren't um, in line with what you want to do is, you know, not equitable and it's not inclusive. And that's what everybody wants to push. So if you want to do that, you need to make sure everybody in those communities are happy with what you're doing. And if not, find another place to go. And that's just the way it is. You don't just get to do whatever you want. Thank you. Your time is up. And Chairwoman Vargas, that concludes public comment on this item. All right. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you to everyone who came down today um, to uh, provide your feedback. And um, it's really great to hear people who really care about their communities come here and have very specific ask about what they want and how we can support them and help them. So I want to make sure I turn it over to Brian so he can address um, an issue that I think is important to all of you. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, I think with respect to um, amplification, live music and how the noise ordinance relates uh, within the context of what we're talking about today. Maybe staff can address that up front and then we can take additional questions. 
Thank you, Chairwoman. Currently under the existing tiered winery ordinance, um, boutique wineries uh, can have live amplified music, but they will require uh, approval of an administrative permit in addition to their entertainment license that they would get through the Sheriff's Department. So that is the, the, the um, situation currently. Um, boutique wineries are allowed by right, so they can come in and set up and establish themselves, but in order to allow for that amplification of music, they will have to get an added permit. Um, let me go, thank you for that. Uh, Supervisor Desmond. Could you say that again? <laughs> Sorry. So in order to amplify the music at events within the winery, they'll have to have an administrative permit approved prior to beginning that type of use. And, and that's, that's, that's currently? Cur that's current, yes. And then it, that would also apply to boutique. If it, this gets approved today, uh, it would, uh, they'd have to come and get a, a, mu a music permit, I guess, uh, to do that uh, with, with this, uh, it, what we approved today. Is that correct? With what, we, with what the board could direct us today, we will look at expanding the ordinance and that would carry over the existing requirements for uh, getting a, an administrative permit for the amplification of music. If I may, Supervisor, yeah. through the chair, uh, woman. So I think we have, in terms of today's ordinance, we weren't specific options. We weren't specifically looking at that issue. Um, so there's a, a question of what's allowed currently in the agricultural zones, and we do have some options for addressing that and providing by right opportunities for music, um, which the team could look at through upcoming zoning ordinance cleanups or amendments, including stakeholder outreach that would go with that. Um, so we could look at that component. If the board would also like for us to look at expanding uh, music options and some of the options presented, that could be done as well. However, that would have to be uh, examined under those options that include an environmental analysis. Because once we start looking at zones that have a lot of residences nearby, we do need to analyze what the impacts would be. Okay. Um, so we could address today's issue in the ag zones at no cost through our existing zoning ordinance update. Or we could cons and or we could consider this issue in any future expansion as well. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I, it, this has been a long time coming, and I'm glad to see it return to the board. And I want to thank PDS for putting all these options together. I thought this was a wine uh, agenda item, but it turned into a music agenda item. So um, I'll just briefly go ahead. The wineries, you know, and in, in, in all the activities that surround them, from growing grapes, the retail sales. They promote agro-tourism, they're their major, major economic driver for the region. Agriculture is a multi-billion dollar industry in, in our county. And I think we should be doing more to support the growers and the winery operations. Um, while it actually helps build the economy here in Ramona and, and uh, throughout the unincorporated area. Which is why I like the idea of allowing these uses, actually these uses are abutting rural residential uh, uh, zones. So, um, this is not a radical concept. I mean, as it is, certain uh, cities already do this. And my district, uh, Oceanside, does this. And they, they allow boutique uh, wineries in uh, rural residential areas. And um, yet we in the county, for the people who live across the street, that in, from the city uh, limits, see the city is able to do it, but we're not. So I'm glad we're, we're finally catching up. So I do want to um, move forward with this today. I would like to see us move forward and then potentially, and then give direction to maybe come back with opportunities for music options. Um, one of the gentlemen from, from the, gentlemen, uh, from the Chamber of Commerce, he, he had suggested limited amplified music. And that can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. But it sounds like we've already got this pretty much handled or, or you know, we're, when we're dealing with houses nearby and other things, so we've got a, sort of a system already in place. So I would like to see that come back um, to, to us. And if my colleagues want to revise that in any way, but I would like to see, I would like to pass this today, what we have in front of us, and then have the, have the staff come back with options for amplified music at the wineries um, to, uh, so I'm, I'm hearing that the, uh, that music is the sound of money uh, coming to the region. So uh, we want to make, make sure everybody's viable, but also neighbor friendly as well. So I'm going to make a motion for uh, um, taking option one which expands the areas in which wineries can operate uh, subject to a, an administrative permit uh, by, and it's gonna increase by about the uh, number of uh, 
for the land use from 30, uh, about 33,000 to 62,000 acres, which is a lot, in rural residential. Um, and this is the least cost, quickest way to increase the allowances into our tiered winery ordinance, and we have the money uh, for this already within the um, uh, current budget and within the uh, next year's budget. And uh, our next year's land, what is it, the sustainable land, uh, Land, the sustainable land use framework working. Uh, so this is an administrative uh, permit. It's fairly minor and it still allows our, our staff to uh, ensure these projects are compatible with the existing land uses. So I'd like to make the motion for option one uh, for this report and then for the staff to come back with options for uh, amplified music at these uh, venues and even at other venues uh, so we can be fair across the board in both ag and the uh, rural uh, residential areas. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question, a clarifying question. So what does that mean, because I still am a little, want to make sure that I understand this. So what does that mean for them right now? Right, because, and how long would the ordinance process take? Because it's going to be, I mean, it's San Diego, it's spring, this is when people come out, you know, and, and I love the wineries. So can we just find out, what does that mean in terms of time, timing? Yes. So right now, a winery, a boutique winery, that would like to have live amplified music would have to get an administrative permit, which there's a cost and time associated with that permit. In order to remove that requirement, we'll have to amend the zoning code. Um, we could pair this type of action to remove the requirement for a, an administrative permit with an upcoming zoning code amendment that staff is working on separately. Um, and the time frame for that is approximately 12 months. Um, which we could start, you know, by the springtime. Um, until then, the requirement for an administrative permit still exists, mm -hmm. and we can't um, waive that until we would amend the ordinance to do so. Okay. And how long does it take to get, so if I was a winery owner and I wanted to get a permit today, how long does it, how much does it cost and how much is it? so that I can have music. Yeah, Chairwoman Vargas, um, it typically takes around six to 12 months to obtain an administrative permit. Oh, wow. It could be quicker depending on how fast the applicant kind of addresses issues and prepares the studies. In terms of the cost, most of it is driven by environmental review and state law requirements. It can range from $20,000 to $30,000 depending on how sensitive the site is and some of the issues that need to be looked at. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to let my colleagues ask more questions. Uh, Supervisor Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> uh, just uh, uh, for some of the folks that are watching our board meeting, like Napa, Ramona is a state-recognized wine region. It's a natural wine region. It's not something that Ramona made up. The state has recognized as a wine region. Uh, second, I've had a lot of uh, community coffees that represent this area for over 15 years. Uh, I've watched the wine region grow. Uh, uh, they've really uh, matured as the vineyards have re matured. Their wine has matured, and we've got great products up there. And I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce and uh, Bob for outstanding work. This is a community of fewer than 22,000 people, and yet they have 2,000. So this tells you that the demand for music and in the community is very high. I can't go to Ramona that somebody doesn't bring this to my attention. And like in every community, there's a small group of people that, that oppose everything, and they have every right to. Uh, I'd like to second the motion of my colleague, uh, but I'd also like to offer a friendly amendment I think that you'll like. And we've heard a lot of people today from Ramona who would welcome the opportunity to, to have live music at wineries. I want to be clear, though, uh, that we're not talking about huge rock concerts or even music that you'd hear at a large wedding. Uh, I would like staff to look at how boutique wineries can have live music with parameters. This would include possible limit on hours and types of ampl amplification. I also would, uh, I also think they should be able to do more than six community events a year uh, if the setup is correct. Uh, I request that staff would also do community outreach in the with the unincorporated residents, which you're, you always do, and I appreciate that. But can we, uh, a little unrelated to this, I would like you to look into allowing live music 
in additional events as part of the upcoming update to the zoning ordinance. So, Davia, you, everything you said were uh, uh, music to my ears because that's exactly what I intended to make in a motion. But if we could do that, and if the motion maker would accept it, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. When someone says yes, I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> Vice Chair uh, Lawson Weimer. Um, yeah, I, first of all, just thank you to the team for the work. Um, I'm, I'm personally very excited um, about the opportunities for our region's economy. And uh, like the chair, I also like to go to wineries. So <laughs> I'm a personal, um, personal fan and have received a lot of positive communications um, from my own constituents who don't necessarily live in, in Ramona, but um, are excited to frequent um, the region. So I think option one is, makes sense and I'm um, happy to see this move forward and appreciate the clarification about the live music, which seems to be a big, a big thing that people are excited about. So thanks. Uh, Supervisor Montgomery Step. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I I'm also um, in, am in support of this uh, motion. I based on competing budget priorities, I think it's a prudent um, option. I, I do like option three um, with the, um, the overlay zones, um, but I understand that, you know, we're open to exploring those things as we move forward. It, it, we're gonna have a lot of work to do around this. So um, I'm very supportive of the additional changes that are in the motion as well. Um, I just wanted to, to bring up one thing maybe to think about as we move forward. Um, just any reference to the San Diego Food Systems Alliance 2030 uh, Food Vision Plan uh, for more in-depth food systems uh, planning opportunities that can be explored as we go through this process of the sustainable land use framework. Um, I, you know, for me, this is, doesn't, of course, impact my district as much because it, it, it of course, uh, impacts unincorporated areas, but there are some urban areas within the county uh, unincorporated uh, that, that may benefit from this as well. And um, it, we're seeing, as we see arts and entertainment districts kind of pop up, I would just want to make sure that, that everyone has uh, the type of access and benefit that this will bring. So thank you very much, and I'm really excited about it. And um, I'll be visiting Ramona very soon. <laughs> we'll have to do a tour. All right. <laughs> All right, with that, um, seeing no additional comments, and thank you for that additional motion, and appreciate all the feedback uh, from my colleagues. I think any time we can understand that there's uh, rules and laws, but I think if there's anything that we can do to help support, um, especially your small businesses, uh, you know, happy to do that any way we can. All right, with that, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. And Chairwoman Vargas, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present voting aye. All right. Thank you very much, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, the next item on our agenda is non-agenda public comment. Um, Clerk, can you please call the remainder of the speakers? Yes, thank you, Chairwoman Vargas. We still have 11 total requests to speak on matters not listed on the agenda, one individual in person, and 11 requesting to speak by phone. So total of 12 public commenters left. We will begin with the in-person speaker. I would like to invite forward Zoa Pham. You all have two minutes to address the board, and if you could please begin by stating your name for the record. Hi, Supervisors. My name is Zora Fahim, President and Founder of Los Angeles Alliance for Animals. Uh, we specialize in equine cruelty, and we are very concerned right now um, with what is occurring in Artesian Road in Cielo. Um, I am a voting constituent uh, for District 5 and community organizer, the former campaign staffer for Assemblymember Tasha Berner Horvat, former intern in Sacramento for Assemblymember Mainshine. Mr. Desmond, as your voting constituent, constituent I wanted to thank you for 
supporting my Meatless Monday proclamation when you were mayor in conjunction with Palmer Health, where I mentored 50 to 100 pre-med interns every three months, months with Ellie Gardner, who is now Ellie Mainshine. I have lobbied animal welfare laws for the past 10 years at the local, state, and federal level, and we have never had an office like Supervisor Tara Larson Reamer, who has refused to meet with our nonprofit, and also your very own constituents, Mrs. Reamer, uh, to discuss this very important issue. So I hope that you'd reconsider to meet with us, Mrs. Reamer, so that we can remove all the animals in Artesian Road and Cielo to be sent to a sanctuary through their wonderful and hardworking detectives in the Sheriff's State Station in Poway, because animal services has failed. Pre please reform animal services. Please put pressure on uh, District Attorney Summer Stephan to prosecute. Uh, Mrs. Reamer, Mrs. Reamer, I, I, I'm your, we're, we're here talking about your issue. Can you look at me, please? See, she's not even paying attention, which just shows, I'm gonna show you videos next time of an emaciated horse that is languishing. Laws continue to be violated here. And she's not even taking this, um, this issue seriously, which is very concerning. Uh, the animals in the county are in peril and crisis, and I'm urging you supervisors to please have compassion for these animals. County of Animal Services is lacking true law enforcement for animal neglect, abuse, outreach, and proper training and education has been actually lacking, which shows in their service to animals and the community, which is the reason why we are respectfully <laughs> urging you to please reform this agency and work with Thank the Poway. Thank you. Your time's up. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from those that have requested to speak by phone. When it is your turn to speak, you'll be unmuted and then you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I'd like to remind the callers again, they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking and we'll begin with our first caller. Hey, it's Jim. Did anyone notice in yesterday's meeting the atrocious behavior of the board chair? I cannot let this pass without mention. Anyone who gets a chance, check out the video or the transcripts of the meeting February 27th when Nora Vargas chose to target Audra after she spoke. Without any reason, Nora gave a second warning without a first one. And then truly with no cause, she claimed that Audra disturbed the procedure and claimed this wasn't about anyone's opinion she was throwing Audra out, apparently just because the tyranny is over the top obvious. And every one of the sheriff and board is complicit, allowing that behavior to go on. I don't know how you guys sleep at night. It may take one brave sheriff to say no to Nora when she yelps out her unilateral, emotionally driven, and possibly illegal dictates. Do we have a brave sheriff? Do we have another board member who will hold her accountable to the atrocious behaviors? We can pray. And by the way, you all were late 16 minutes. This meeting was supposed to start at 9 a.m. and it started at 9.16. Very common. Every minute that goes by, your dishonor grows. Every second that goes by, your lack of integrity shows. The meeting time is an agreement between the board and the people. And like any agreement, it matters clearly. How can we trust anything you people do when you can't, one, keep a very simple agreement, or two, own up to it when you break an agreement? You haven't earned our trust or respect, but you have a chance to wake up and change, and wake up and change now. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next speaker. This is Ann Riddle calling, and good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. As a person who works in public health, I received the notices from the Alcohol Beverage Control from California Department of Public Health, their tobacco control section, and from the Department of Cannabis Control, the DCC. Mostly I'm concerned on behalf of youth, and so I like to keep up with how minor decoy operations are going and whether the products have consumer advisories out and uh, what sort of products are under supervision because of their concerns. Every week we get 
uh, press releases from the Department of Cannabis Control regarding notification of mandatory products recall. The one this week is recalling a cannabis from the DCC is recalling a cannabis inhaler, and it mentions across the county, across I'm sorry, the state, those counties where this. They have marijuana permittees who are selling these products. And so I thought for the purpose of the county's code enforcement, I'd like to share with you what's going on in the county regarding this product. It's important to remember that these recalls only happen when there is, as they say, an immediate and serious threat to human life or health. And there were nine this week here in our county. The one that's in the incorporated area is at 618 Pine in Ramona. So I'd like to respectfully ask our code enforcement in the county to check because when this list is put out, these are from um, marijuana uh, pot, sorry, pot shops that have already sold this product. It's not just those who have received it. So it's already a, an issue. And while they're checking into this particular pot shop about this. Thank you. Your time is up. We'll go to our next speaker. It's truth. Nora, yesterday you said people crossing the border are qualified to clean homes and tend gardens. Do you realize how racist that is? Are you saying that the black, brown, and Asian people coming here are incapable of reaching anything higher in this country? Wow, so much for progress. Just so you know, people crossing have been interviewed. Many claim to be in the medical field, so watch that misinformation. And, of course, I had to listen on a different note to your State of the County address. I actually recognize your niece, Fatima, from two years ago when she did your swear-in. And I even saw Anna Hoiberg in the audience score 10 points. And you know I can't allow Nora nonsense to go without a rebuttal, not on my watch. You talked about leaving no veteran behind. But the ironic thing is that supporting an open border leaves every single thing a veteran thought they were fighting to defend our country behind. And I know this is how you feel. For me, it's really hard to sit here and to listen. And I understand I'm a public official. And we can hear this, it's fine, but it is not okay. It is not okay. A few moments later. No, no, nobody's emotional here. More misinformation. Anyway, also bragged about Southwestern calling it the jewel of the South Bay. Well, some consider it a jewel of corruption. Them fighting words, no doubt, but I'm not the one who made a baby cry. Well, let me end on a positive. Nor I'm happy to disagree with you about a million things at least once a week, but I do recognize that you genuinely care about people, so it's okay to be emotional, just like it's okay to want border security. And Monica, even though Consuelo did a good job putting you in your place, I think you've been doing an all right job. Of course, it's not because I agree with everything, but because you haven't changed since leaving city council. You still listen and you still question, and I did appreciate a lot of your comments yesterday. Only disagreement. You said that you hope we don't have another crisis, but what you're going to learn real quick is that everything here at the county is a crisis. It's the sound of money, Jim. There you go. The more you know. Thank you. Your time is up. We'll go to our next speaker. Hi, this is Lauren Harriman. It was wonderful to see your proclamation yesterday recognizing Environmental Health Month. There's a pollution problem that deserves more attention, the problem of chemical, plastic, and battery waste from e-cigarettes. Most users are completely unaware that e-cigarettes are considered hazardous waste and are never supposed to go in a regular trash can or end up as litter. Unfortunately, no one is providing this important information, not vape manufacturers, retailers, or government agencies. Lithium-ion batteries can explode, and if left outside, the batteries slowly deteriorate, leaving heavy metals to seep into the water and soil. Vape liquids themselves are made from toxic chemicals, including tin, nickel, and arsenic. Nicotine is poison, originally used as a pesticide in the U.S., and it can be lethal to small children, pets, and wild animals if ingested. Finally, they contain plastic pieces, which can take centuries to decompose. As they break down, they turn into microplastics and then even tinier nanoplastics. These pieces make their way into every part of the ecosystem, from deep ocean trenches to the highest mountaintops. They're found in our water, our food, and even in the tissues of our bodies. I would like to encourage a public education campaign on the proper disposal of e-cigarettes. 
and a requirement in the tobacco retail licensing program that retailers provide disposal information. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Thank you. We'll go to our next speaker. Great points, Jay. Yeah, what happened yesterday is atrocious. Uh, and even today with you allowing people to, you know, laugh at other speakers when, you know, you're not being equitable or inclusive with everybody in that and you are, you know, stopping free speech from people for redressing their grievances. You didn't like what I was saying yesterday. You didn't even, you gave everybody a group warning supposedly. I asked you when I went up to the podium the first time I spoke, who was that for? You refused to answer me. Then later you held that against me and gave me another warning that was not even anything I did. I did nothing. I was sitting there silent. You gave me a warning, then gave me another one, and actually gave me two third ones and claimed that the group one was under everybody. But then you were arbitrarily and capriciously going and telling people they had their first warning after you already gave a group warning. So you're not consistent in anything that you're doing, but you can tell that the tyranny is just seeping out of your veins in every single one of you because you continue to allow it, as do the sheriffs, and they're doing your bidding, and it's very sad because you're the ones breaking the law. You're breaking your oaths. You're violating things, not the people. We're just coming in to redress our grievances like we are supposed to do under the First Amendment, and you sit there and you don't like what people say. And so then you try and stop them and you kick us out. Well, you violated our agreement. And now you're going to have more coming down the pipe with money that you're going to have to pay. So it's very sad to see that you think that you guys can do this. You should be turning away from all of your wicked ways and changing your you know, stance on stuff instead of sitting here and, and silencing people when you're supposed to also be upholding your oath to the Constitution and making sure that our rights aren't violated, as is the sheriff. But that's all you do, and you do it on a consistent basis. And it's always with people you don't like what they have to say, and then you sit there and you profess and act like and tout that you want to hear from the public. It's obvious you don't, especially when you get triggered because you're an illegal, you're a, a first-generation immigrant, and you want illegals to come here. Thank you. Your time is up. We'll go to our next speaker. Hello, this is Kelly McCormick. I'm a public health educator. I would like to Hi Kelly, are you still there? We can't hear you. You may have muted yourself. I'm sorry, thank you for letting me know. Um, hello, this is Kelly McCormick, public health educator. And a friend recently renewed her driver's license. When the new license came, it included a chart showing intoxication levels related to the number of standard alcoholic drinks the person has consumed. This is helpful information, but not enough. It's time to increase efforts to educate the public about driving under the influence of marijuana. It's dangerous and illegal. Nationwide, nearly 40 people a day die in crashes due to impaired driving, according to data from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. More than 18 million people, 16 and over, drove under the influence of alcohol. Nearly 12 million drove under the influence of marijuana. Almost 2.5 million drove with other illicit drugs in their system, according to the 2020 National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Combining substances compounds the risk. A AAA study found that drivers who use both marijuana and alcohol were significantly more prone to drive under the influence. They also were more likely to report speeding, aggressive driving, intentional red light running, and texting while driving. The California Office of Traffic Safety reports that people who drive after using marijuana may increase their risk of getting into a crash by up to 35%. I hope you will take this information into consideration and launch a public education campaign about driving under the influence of marijuana. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll go to our next speaker.
And Chairwoman Vargas, that public speaker uh, unfortunately dropped off, so that concludes the request for non-agenda public communication this morning. We will now go to closed session matters that were continued from uh, yesterday's meeting for, oh, I think that, that speaker just called back, so we'll, we'll give Kathleen a, a second chance here. Hey, Kathleen, go ahead and begin your comments. Thank you. Good afternoon, board. My name is Kathleen Lippitt. Promoting public health is more challenging than, than ever. We are fighting on three fronts. First, we had to contend with a powerful and wealthy marijuana industry. Then the loss of a once collaborative partnership with the county. The industry's third partner seems to be the state. When marijuana was commercialized in the state, and it stood to profit from marijuana sales. So the disappearance of public health messaging warning the public of the dangers of high-potency marijuana messages disappeared. Still, the public naively believed the responsibility of the California Department of Cannabis Control would regulate, track, and inspect ensure, and ensure product safety. But the DCC admits it's unable to test for dangerous pesticide contamination. And even when the DCC does find evidence of dangerous mold, heavy metals, or pesticides, their first step is not to warn the public, but to warn the manufacturer that their products would be embargoed. It does, and if it does not mo notify the public, they, are, they cannot be kept safe. Turns out that even when they put these products under an embargo, they turn up in retail, or retail businesses. Manufacturers were required to have their products lab tested, but labs were found to be falsifying data on behalf of retailers. Eventually, the state spent $11 million to build a lab at UCSD to serve as a reference lab for testing. However, even that lab has failed to meet any of its contractual deadlines to provide testing for DCC. The bottom line is what are consumers to do? Perhaps it's time to listen to your common sense and to evaluate whether or not using a drug that has been found to be dangerous to your health, welfare, and being is a good idea. Whether or not you're going to be contributing to it. Thank you. Your time is up. And Chairman Vargas, that again concludes the request for non-agenda public communication this morning. We will now move to item uh, Item number 18 from yesterday's agenda, which was closed session. We have seven total requests to speak, one individual in person, and six requesting to speak by phone. For any members of the public that have requested to speak on this item by phone, if you could please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. I'd like to call forward uh, Mark. Not seeing any movement in the chamber. We'll now hear from those that have requested to speak by phone. Again, when it's your turn to speak, you'll be unmuted. You will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I'd like to remind the callers they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. And we'll go ahead and begin with our first caller. Yeah, this climate change litigation um, challenge to the Forest Conservation Initiative Amendment to the county's general plan for 70 acres is devastating long-term consequences in the San Diego back county and would increase GHGs, and it's not complying with CICA, which isn't surprising, but at the same time, nothing you're doing is, um, you know, mitigating anything with the climate. You're always increasing GHGs by everything that you're doing with pretending to save the climate. So, you know, even though they're on kind of a different side and um, of that, uh, and you did fail to, you know, address the mitigation and it violates zoning laws and requires um, uh, GHG um, eval based on the cap. You know, you're never doing things that you'll like sometimes do stuff that will, you know, mitigate things. Um, but most of the things that you're doing and all of the greenhouse uh, gas or climate uh, green energy infrastructure causes more greenhouse gases. And it always will. No matter what you do, it's always going to do that. So, you know, when you sit here and tout like you're going to mitigate these things by, you know, having open space or using solar or lithium bombs or whatever it is, all of those things are used made to, by using gas and oil. You're never going to get outside of that. So when you're sitting here and acting like you are, you're actually destroying the planet in the process. You're contradicting your own, you know, agenda. 
and but that's what you do with everything so it's not surprising and just wonder how much money the community is going to have to pay out of the public liability fund for this litigation and some kind of settlement that's going to come forward if it is money that's going to come forward you know but um yeah, I mean, just everything. It's a big old climate, God, that you guys will sacrifice everyone to. You'll have everybody go straight, drive, driven into poverty just to push this climate, God, agenda. And you don't care about people's health or safety because it's emitting, uh, most of these technologies emit immense amounts of radiation. And Thank you. Your time is up. We'll go to our next speaker. Gosh, everything. Uh, ditto to everything Audra just stated. Um, I guess I just really wanted to finish my non-agenda, but, uh, you know, I'm not mad at you, Monica. And I wanted to finish saying what I had to say. What my father lived through being treated like a second-class citizen, even after he fought for his country, is not my story. It doesn't define uh, me can or you my please, uh, identify what item you're speaking to? This is a closed session item, ma'am. Okay, I'm speaking on 12. This is not my story. It doesn't define me or, ca or my capacities. Consuelo, I muted you. You're, this is not item 12. This is the matters continued yesterday for closed session, item 18. So you've got to speak to item 18, which is closed session. Okay, so conflicts of interest. And um, yeah. So it doesn't define me or my capacities, but, but many of the people do use their ancestors and the color of their skin to define who they are now, today. I'm not a victim of my father's circumstances or of my ancestors. Thank you. I'm done. To the next speaker. Hey, it's truth. Aren't you guys happy that you can move closed session to the next day instead of trying to make a decision at 7 p.m. yesterday? As I says, the only case is Cleveland National Forest Foundation versus the County of San Diego. But when looking up the case number in the item, it says the case is actually the California National Forest Foundation and the California Native Plant Society versus the county and this board of supervisors. So which case is it? Luckily, I read a Times of San Diego article, so I could say the Cleveland National Forest Foundation is suing the county over Joel's Alpine Amusement Park. The Cleveland Foundation was formerly ran under Jack to his shoe. Who would have talked to you yesterday if you guys hadn't taken up my whole day and night? For those that don't know, the foundation even sued Sandag a few years ago. Now they don't like how big this park is and are using the excuses of butterflies, toads, and bats to fight the park being built. The legitimate argument is that the park poses fire risk and traffic congestion. They also allege that the county didn't consider alternative versions of the plans, even when several meetings had people asking for a smaller version of the park. And your response, Joel? Let's just get it built already. I've been waiting for 30 years. I guess when it doesn't benefit your personal vision, you're able to quickly forget about the standard speed of government being snail speed. Something else you need to remember, Joel, is that you're supposed to be a representative. When you got that seat, you were supposed to leave the I behind as much as possible in favor of constituents' wishes. And when that item was last discussed, Joel, you basically said that it wasn't your responsibility to educate people on updates to county actions. I agree with that, but I think that was a disrespectful way of saying people need to be more involved and on the county's butt at every turn before they get played by supervisors like yourself. It's actually a sad admission of how you don't engage the community enough, not even with the coffees, and also how the community doesn't engage enough in their own government and also how frivolous lawsuits are commonplace by environmental extremist organizations that Jackson Vichu belong to. But thank you for your explanation about Ramona, Joel, all of you winos. Thank you for your information today. Have a good day. Thank you. Your time is up. And Chairwoman Vargas, that concludes public comment on this item. Um, all right, with that, I want to thank you. Thank you, and we're going to proceed to closed session. And uh, the board will now recess into closed session to continue consideration of those matters listed under 18, uh, under item 18 on yesterday's agenda. If there are any reportable actions, they will be reported out after the conclusion of closed session today. And the next regular meeting of the board will take place on Tuesday, March 12th at 9 a.m.